Good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many faces this morning. And um, yesterday, I feel like was a, a wonderful success. And it was so great to connect with everybody last night at the poster session. And um, so I'm excited for day two of the research symposium. Uh, welcome to everybody in the room and welcome to everybody online. And uh, just a couple reminders of folks that did not um, attend yesterday uh, in person. Uh, if you haven't been here before, we have uh, bathroom facilities down the hallway on the right. And please visit our nature center if you haven't been here before. It's pretty cool. And uh, of course, we have snacks and coffee. Please, please, please eat everything up so we don't have anything to put away at the end of the day. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, for those online, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, you have joined as uh, uh, in mute, on mute, however the correct term is. Uh, when we get to the question uh, period of each presentation, uh, there is an option if you would like to come off mute and uh, ask your question. Uh, what we ask is that you raise your hand and you can see uh, on the screen right now, on the right side is the raise hand function. Uh, Kennedy will take you off mute, but you will have to unmute yourself as well uh, to ask the question. Uh, you can also ask the question in the questions box and we will read it to the presenter. A uh, couple other uh, remember the agenda and for the link to the Padlet, which has information about each of the presentations during the symposium, that is in the handouts tab um, in GoToWebinar. Okay, perfect. The symposium is being recorded and afterwards, after we clean it up a little bit, it will be available online at ApalachicolaReserve.com. And if you want more information about the speakers or to connect with them, uh, please go to the Padlet link. And you can also use the QR code here. So without further ado, tee up our first speaker. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lexington Preheim, and I work in the stewardship department here. We're gonna start our morning session off with Dr. Andy Kane from the University of Florida. And his presentation will be on oyster health and monitoring observations update from the UF Aquatic Pathobiology Laboratory. Take it away, Andy. Good morning, everybody. It's a real privilege to um, share with all of you this morning. And for this talk, I would like to mention that uh, all of this research was made possible through my colleagues, um, Ross Brooks, um, and my graduate student, uh, Shelby Thomas, Rebecca Rash, Lauren Hinton Lang, and our colleague, Shannon Hartsfield, our professional waterman from whom we've learned so much. So, oyster health, assuming that I can advance my slides here, there we go. Oyster health and population assessment data are critical components to the implementation science of oyster habitat monitoring and restoration needs and impact. In support of these important efforts, we experimented with approaches to facilitate ease of data collection and improve the consistency and quality of data across monitoring programs. And as such, I'll be talking about assessing oyster shell impacts from shell boring organisms and offering an alternate quick and dirty um, condition index approach and conducting assessments for dermo disease. I'll also briefly touch on occupational health and safety and outreach efforts as related to Apalachicola Bay and the Big Bend region. There we go. Forgive me. There we go. So um, let me introduce the players for you with a barking dog. Um, cumulatively, these boring organisms, uh, Polydora, a, a boring worm, uh, Diplothyra, a, a boring clam, which is a bivalve that parasitizes a bivalve, and uh, Cleona salata, uh, boring sponge. Uh, these players all act to um, reduce shell density, divert energy from growth to protective shell production, and they facilitate a more rapid breakdown of shell material in the habitat. So the presence of these parasites and their impact tends to be greatest under extended elevated salinity and temperature conditions. And we investigated ways to quantify shell parasite prevalence and severity in a reproducible way. 
So for each parasite type, um, we found there were there were ways to visually um, rank and find impressions for um, each of these um, boring organisms and come up with a ranking scheme based on a scale of one to five that includes half ranks and um, coming up with a visual aid such as what you're looking at to um, supplement the descriptive terms. Um, we're able to actually put down half ranks as well. So there's a one, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, and so on. Um, and the idea is to have sufficient precision that with multiple trained observers, uh, you have the precision of plus or minus a half of a rank. So inquisitive minds um, lead to taking x-rays. <laughs> and x-rays revealed what can't be seen with the naked eye. And what we see with the naked eye is really a very gross underestimation of the actual cumulative uh, shell damage caused by these boring organisms. So in order to discern the relationship between radiology or a gold standard where you can see right through the shell um, and visual observation data, we compared ranked shell damage from data based on visual versus um, radio radiology. And so these are data um, using radiology to indicate the, the prevalence of shell damage from the three different boring parasites by size class. And what we're seeing here is that by the time oysters are sub-harvest size, by the time they're over 50 millimeters on average from all sites that we've sampled, um, that Polydora is present throughout the population and Diplothyra and Cleona um, are, are there's over 75% se over prevalence starting at that size class and moving forward. Um, what we also know is when we compare observations by the naked eye inside the shell versus outside the shell for each of the parasite types, there is a very different type of observation. And we compared both of those to radiography. So by size class, um, each of the groups of bars here, there's the open, the hatched, and the red um, in that order. So that's the inside the outside of the shell with your naked eye and the red bars are the radiograph data. That's the gold standard reality. So you can compare by size class in, in this example. Um, you will, in each size class, you'll see more polydora on the inside of the shell compared with on the outside of the shell across the board. And that those inside visual observations uh, grossly underestimate what you can see um, through x-rays. So, in comparing each of these, we now can see for Diplothyra, the situation reverses, that for each size class, you can make better visual observations outside the shell than you can on the inside of the shell. And then finally, the same for Cleona, you can see them better on the outside of the shell by the naked eye than you can on the inside. And all of these observations underestimate um, both functionally and statistically what you can see radiologically. So we worked with a modeler who can do things that I can't do and coming up with a polynomial expression accounting for the size of the oyster, its height, um, which valve you're looking at and what you can see grossly with the naked eye by a, a quantitative ranking scale. You can then take those data, plug it into this equation and say, well, what does it give you? And so now these data sets are now looking uh, in, in each set by size class. For Polydor, we're always going to look at the inside because we know that that's where you can grossly see more data, get better data, more accurate data from the inside versus the outside of the shell. So comparing that with um, the predicted, which is that middle hatched bar, um, you can see that the predicted is substantially different and there is no statistical difference between those exclamation points are only showing that there's a difference between the predicted and the data to the left, you know, what you can see with the naked eye. There is no statistical difference between the predicted and what you can see radiologically. And that is actually the same with these equations that were discerned for both uh, for Polydora, Cleona, and Diplothyra. So we know that um, shell parasites are pretty ubiquitous, um, these, these shell parasites, um, and they are positively correlated, their presence and severity are positively correlated with the height of the oyster. Um, we know that weakened shells make these oysters, when they're alive, more vulnerable to predation, and whether the oyster's alive or not, there's shell erosion from all of that surface area that's created, so there's an impact on erosion, breakdown, and shell budget. 
Um, the visual observations that we can see um, with the naked eye significantly underestimate what you can actually see uh, through x-ray. Um, and we know that these shell parasites, their, their presence and prevalence and the shell damage that is caused freshly um, occurs when there are extended um, high salinity conditions. Um, shell parasite excavations um, also have an impact on uh, the market value um, of oysters in that it reduces the, um, you know, it makes for a weaker shell. Um, it allows it to break more readily when shucking. And then relative to climate change, you know, there are certain trends that are ongoing and with a slope that's albeit remarkably close to zero, but it isn't zero. And we know that salinity over time is increasing ever so slightly about two parts per thousand per decade. And the pH of Apalachicola Bay, um, these are all as measured at Cat Point um, over the last 17 years, um, over a 17 year period, um, is declining at, at a rate that's pretty much paralleling, uh, you know, oceanic um, uh, ocean acidification rates at about a 10th of a pH unit per 10 years. So um, parasite, um, these shell boring parasites, we can expect that um, when there are extended periods of elevated salinity and, and temperature that allow their presence to be higher and the lower pH that allows for greater erosional processes going on, that um, these issues will continue to become um, um, exacerbated. So the next topic I wanted to talk about is habitat assessment and monitoring using tongue depletion as an approach. And I'm actually not gonna talk much about it because our next talk by my colleague, Lauren Hintonline, will really get into this. But I wanted to talk about depletion tonguing as a method that allows us to not only get population data that is quantitative you know, and, and uh, can be normalized per square meter and uh, per acre, but you can also apply this to looking at the substrate that's there and that's what we did so as substrate breaks down due to tidal and storm surge and just erosional processes that as i mentioned are exacerbated by extreme shell parasitism and shell breaks down into smaller and smaller fragments we used depletion tonguing as an assessment tool to be able to map out the um the abundance in terms of uh, how much how much um substrate depth is there or what's the density of existing material in terms of cubic yards per acre. And that's what this bubble plot is showing in a given area that was sampled with multiple reps in different areas. And the size of the bubbles represent um, the density of shell that was there. And with the same type of quantitative data, we're able to um, estimate um, substrate depth, the area sampled, and also look at substrate quality by having another um, equation that accounts for the size of the oyster and whether it's whole and large or smaller and fragmented or hash. And putting that into the equation, um, it sort of tells you what's there and what might be needed for considerations in restoration and monitoring. So I wanna skip now to another um, metric that is commonly, in, uh, commonly indicated in, in restoration monitoring, but in habitat monitoring and looking at oyster health, and that's condition index. So this is a scaled uh, condition key that was put out um, you know some years ago that was that was developed because the standard condition index really takes a little bit of time and it's kind of stinky because that involves um, taking the oyster determining the shell volume inside and then taking the shucked meat and any liquor and then drying it um, uh, completely and then getting a weight of that dried material and its relationship between that dried weight and the interior shell volume that with a multiplier comes out and gives you a condition index. Um, because that takes a couple of days and there's the smell and drying um, and a little bit more, a bit more effort, you know, methods like this were developed, but it's so hard to come up with um, um, a consistent, reliable and repeatable um, approach where folks from different programs and laboratories can make this work. So we used, um, we developed a visual key for uh, meat ranks by basically asking how much uh, would you want to put this in your mouth and eat it? I mean, there's one way to look at that. So part of the way we've ranked these on a scale of one to five, and again, there's half ranks here, um, is by visual understanding based on color, based on plumpness, based on opacity, and based on its volume. But we also talk about um, the degree to which, um, you know, how it would be looked at in the retail market in the, you know, for consumption in terms of um, whether or not it's a select oyster or just a, a good eating oyster. 
So um, these ranks um, basically provide, it's really easy to get these, you just shuck them and, and as long as you don't damage them when shucking, you can get really reproducible data. And when we compare our meat rank data in green to actual condition index data from the same um, animals from uh, collections that we've taken from 2015 through 2019, what we see is that our, our, our visual empirical meat ranks really do parallel what we can see in the standard condition index, but it lacks the sensitivity. So you can see the seasonality that at the beginning of the years, condition goes up, right? That's when these oysters are much more plump. And then as it gets in the warmer months, um, the condition goes down. So if you really don't have a drying oven and you don't have time, but you really need to collect data, how do you be compliant on collecting some data sets that are important? Um, this is certainly offering one tool that um, can be standardized and provide insights. So lastly, with regard to oyster health, I wanted to talk about um, Perkinsis, um, dermo disease as it's known. And um, this is a disease that um, is virtually present in every collection that we go out and look at oysters, whether they are farmed, whether they're um, wild or whether they're leased on bottom. And um, dermo affects um, oyster growth. It affects, um, uh, it, and it can affect their their mortality as well. You can have apps, you can have population declines and um, population mortalities associated with this disease, although not common. And luckily, um, in Apalachicola Bay and in the Gulf, this is really the only primary um, parasitic disease of great relevance. But again, in order to be able to do this before the advent of molecular tools, there's a visual inspection using um, microscopic staining that allows you to visualize the spores and, and what we're dealing with at very low density, this thing worked pretty well because you count them in a field. And you can, you know, counting is theoretically something that anybody can do. But then when you get to higher density hypnospores in your samples under the microscope, the difference between 25% and a lot more than 25% or just a little bit more than 50% or is it closer to 50% becomes somewhat subjective. And in fact, excuse me, even if um, the reproducibility is one issue, but coming up with really what is 25% was a big issue. So this is a graphic showing dots at three different densities, the top, the middle, and the bottom. These dots happen to all be the identical size. The hypnospores from Perkinsis can vary in size greatly. So how you interpret what is seen under the microscope is pretty tricky and percent coverage of hypnospores has to be interpreted based on how much in this case black versus white you can see on average in multiple microscopic fields at a certain magnification so the only way to do this consistently is to imagine you're playing tetris how do you get to a percentage coverage by these hypnospores so when you see them randomly distributed across microscopic fields, it's hard to get a density in percentage, but if you allow these um, to sort of become clustered and you can sort of analyze them as an area, you can determine the area that's filled by the hypnospores and the area that's not. And that's a much easier percentage to get a reckoning with. So how do you really do this? So we came up with a visual cue that uh, we know that hypnospores exist in uh, different sizes and at different densities. And so we have a visual cue that goes along for dermo interpretation that we keep right by our microscope. And so you can actually look at that and get and line, align your impressions uh, microscopically with, with this chart. And these are all standardized so that, you know, you can barely see it on top, but um, there are different um, scores there, 0 0.33, 0 0.67 you know, one point series. These are all very low density. And this is, those are the common uh, Prekinsis rankings that are seen in all collections. And it's when you start seeing the higher rankings um, that, you, you know, it's very difficult to understand that. For example, where my arrow is right here, this right here is only 0.67, um, which is only 11 to 74 hypnospores per per field. It's a very low density. It's really hard to get. So the visual cue really helps out a lot. And so the take home on derma was that derma was present throughout the resource in Apalachicola Bay. Um, it's present in all samples that we've seen and um, um, their prevalence and severity increases with the size of the oyster. 
and we know that it impacts meat quality, growth, and mortality. So these observations are very helpful. Population size structure also affects dermo impacts. I wanted to briefly mention occupational health and safety. It's a project funded by the CDC and NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety, because we work with um, commercial seafood harvesters um, around the Big Bend and in the Panhandle and actually into Mississippi and Alabama. And we've learned things there that it turns out that people who monitor resources um, do a lot of the same things that some people that are professional commercial seafood workers do, i.e. they get in the water to do something. And when you get into the water, there's certain exposures that happen, um, including exposures to bacteria, um, and also in the case of Cedar Key, um, exposures to stingray. Uh, we learned that um, um, FWC personnel who are do, in charge of doing the, um, the field work for the FIMS monitoring um, are just as susceptible to stingray puncture injuries as the clam farmers. So a lot of what we've learned from um, this study has application to field workers as well. And then in closing, I wanted to just um, thank the Apalachicola National Estuary Reserve um, and all of their staff and the education department for allowing me to share some of um, these data and, and our research relative to um, oyster habitat change, climate change, and, and how people can maybe change their understanding and value of the resources that really, when you live there, that's it's really your resource. And so this, um, I don't know how many of you had a chance to see this exhibit below the waterline. It was on um, an on exhibit for nine months um, in the education hall right next to where you're sitting right now. And um, these are just some of the outreach um, products that um, we're hoping to be able to um, communicate this science to more broad audiences and support the work with the Apalachicola National Estuarine Reserve. I'd like to thank everybody at the DEP and the ANIR for their support. And that's what I have. Any questions? Questions? Uh, talk to me, so you can just say. Um, yeah, I was wondering how your scale equates to the Mackin scale. And then when using your scale, what magnifications each one of those fields was at. And then also for each of those squares, is that for the entire sample or is that for one field of view? I'm going to try to answer this question. I can barely hear you, unfortunately. So if I don't get it right, hold me to this here. So there, so the looking in the microscope, um, you hunt and peck around at a very low magnification at 4x, and the actual readings are done at 10x. And you need to observe uh, multiple fields, usually five or 10 fields um, that have sample in it, and actually the entire specimen. And then um, you're 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 basically trying to find the average of what you're seeing for what's under the cover slip at 10x magnification. So um, each of those little Tetris uh, um, pixels as they are would represent the hypnospore. And um, it, it is what you're seeing as a percentage in a, in a 10X um, field, if that answers the question. Partially, yeah. Um, so is that, so the square is representative of those five to 10 fields that you've averaged in your mind, essentially? Each of those little Tetris pixels as they were represents a hypnospore um, um, as, as just a graphic representation of, you know, how do you can look at negative space versus positive space of all those little dots. And that what I was trying to get an impression and share with you was that it's really hard to get a percentage as a data point visually from a visual interpretation by just looking at dots unless you can compare it to a, a known density um, that you can see. It's hard to call it. Just a, and then the Tetris allows you to let all the dots fall to the bottom and recognize, you know, on that one slide, what you should be able to see is that on this slide, it's a lot easier to see that a little less than a third of that field is com composed of, of stuff and two thirds of that field. So you can get a 66 or 67% estimate from this field so much easier than you can that, right? That was the only point that I was trying to make. Thanks. We have one question from the online audience from Nikki Dix. Uh, it will differ by estuary, but have you determined an ideal sample sizes uh, 
i.e. the number of oysters to sample for parasites per reef. I forgive me. I'm going to have to ask that you repeat the question, and if you can come a little closer to the microphone, I just the, it's, it's not coming through on this end. No worries. Uh, let me bring it up That's on this computer here. So the question was: It will differ by estuary, but have you determined ideal sample sizes, i.e., the number of oysters to sample per paras uh, for parasites per reef? And is that sampling for any particular output? The, not specified in the question, but so Nikki, if you want to ask a question vocally, I can turn you off of mute and you can ask it yourself. So for each site that we collect data from, um, there's a minimum of 20 animals that need to sort of represent for health assessment that need to represent the size range of animals that are present at that collection site. Uh, we typically double that in order to you know make the data more robust and we have found that 20 is a pretty good number to be able to uh, make comparison is it's certainly enough for dermo and that's pretty much the standard that you have uh, 10 animals that are um, less than 70 that, that are that are smaller and 10 animals that are larger but that represent that size range um, the condition index data is very solid um, and reproducible at an N of 20. Um, health assessments um, for dermo, as I mentioned, um, you will get really good prevalence data from 20. When you're doing novel investigations and you're just starting out and you really want to look at the range and variability that's present, increasing a sample size is certainly what you'd want to do, but um, an N of 20 per collection is typically the minimum that we'll, that we'll use. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. All right, we're going to continue on to our next speaker, which is Lauren Hintonling from University of Florida. And her talk will be on tong depletion sampling for oyster habitat assessment and monitoring, a quantitative, cost effective, safer alternative to quadrat depletion sampling. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Um, my name is Lauren Hintonlang. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Florida in the Department of Environmental and Global Health. And today I'm going to be presenting uh, for you guys on tong depletion sampling as a cost effective approach to oyster habitat monitoring. So as many in the audience are likely aware, uh, oysters are a keystone species. They provide a whole host of ecosystem services ranging from improved water quality, uh, the removal of excess nutrients, uh, the creation and stabilization of shorelines. They're also really efficient ecosystem engineers. So they uh, help create biogenic reef habitat for uh, a whole bunch of commercially and recreationally uh, important species. Uh, and they also once were really important uh, or supported multi-million dollar fishery industries uh, in numerous coastal economies. Uh, so I say once because um, globally it's been estimated that 85% of oyster reefs have been lost and that those that remain are in poor condition. So we've seen that on a global scale, but we've also seen it more locally uh, in Apalachicola Bay. Uh, so this graph here is showing you the annual oyster landings for Franklin County, which encapsulates most of Apalach Apalachicola Bay uh, from 1986, which is just post Hurricane Elena, uh, to 2021. And where that yellow arrow um, is uh, sort of indicates the recent fishery collapse that we've had uh, and sort of the, the trailing into uh, sort of lack of recovery and then um, the official closure to wild harvest in 2020. So, so there's, there's been decline and we've done, we've done a lot of restoration and we are currently doing a lot of restoration. Um, and a lot of those restoration strategies involve cold deposition which basically involves uh, identifying a hard bottom areas where the substrate has been degraded uh, and then supplementing those areas with um, recycled shell, fossilized shell, limestone, granite, uh, cement reef balls. There's a whole host of products that people have been using um, in the hopes that larval oysters are gonna recruit and attach to those locations, uh, grow and sort of restore that vital reef structure that we've, we've been uh, looking for. Um, but I think it's safe to say that over the past 10 years in Apalachicola Bay, we haven't quite gotten the level of recovery that we, we've been desiring. Uh, and we're, nobody is exactly sure why it is. There's a lot of theories out there. Um, but what we do know is that we need to uh, keep monitoring what we're doing. So all that cold deposition is really logistically and financially resource intensive. So it takes a lot of money to go buy all that substrate and then a lot of coordination between a lot of agencies. Uh, to get that substrate from uh, from the land into the water when and where you want it. 
So all that vast expenditure really demands that we're being accountable and that we're assessing our restoration successes and failures. We also need monitoring in order to uh, assess the ecological impact and the performance that our restoration projects are having. Uh, so it's hard to tell if you're being successful if you don't really know what your baseline was. So we need to keep, uh, we need to make sure that we're keep, um, we keep performing those pre and post construction monitoring um, schedules. But keeping to those schedules can also be really expensive, both in time, money, and resources, often more so than just executing that restorative action. So doing culture deposition uh, itself is expensive, but then follow, the follow-up monitoring can be even more expensive. Uh, so a lot of times that monitoring gets overlooked and uh, is, can be somewhat undervalued. So what we uh, have tried to do uh, in order to support a more cost-effective habitat assessment and post-monitoring, uh, post-restoration monitoring, uh, is collect side-by-side -side depletion samples using two techniques, so using hand tongs and also quadrat diving, and then comparing the oyster population uh, densities and size structures that you get from each of those techniques in the hopes that we can validate a low-cost alternate monitoring approach for habitat assessment, monitoring, and compliance. So our hypothesis is that um, essentially that both approaches, so quadra diving and hand tonguing, are going to give you similar oyster density and population size structure data. So what we actually did was we went to these six sites uh, across Apalachicola Bay, uh, randomly chosen, and we took eight to ten uh, depletion samples of both techniques at each site. Um, we collected all of our samples and we took them back to shore to be quantified. Uh, the quantification basically involved uh, counting all of the live and dead oysters and then uh, measuring their heights uh, to the nearest millimeter using manual calibers. And to get a little further into the two techniques, so quadrat diving is uh, the current sort of gold standard for doing uh, oyster monitoring, uh, oyster reef monitoring. It essentially involves uh, taking a PVC quadrat or just a PVC square uh, of known area, usually uh, a quarter of a meter squared, uh, randomly sort of tossing it down to the bottom, diving down and collecting all the oysters, the flora, the fauna, basically all the biota, everything that's in the confines of that quadrat, um, putting it in these yellow bags and then taking it back to the boat uh, to be quantified. Hand tonging uh, is very similar. Uh, you're still doing depletion sampling where you're collecting everything down uh, to an anoxic substrate, um, but you can do it topside. It doesn't require uh, you to get in the water. So essentially knowing all of the specs of your tong, so the distance from the, the handle to the pivot point and then the pivot point to the tong head and the, the width of your tong head, as well as the wingspan of the operator and your water depth, uh, using trigonometry, you can calculate how much area you're sampling. So once you know, um, once you have an idea of how much sampling or uh, how much area you're sampling, you basically can calibrate your tongue licks so that you are depleting the same spot every time. So if, if on the first lick, you don't get down to anoxic substrate, we have a marker, you go back and you tongue the same spot. Uh, you put everything up on the culling board and then you uh, bag it and again, take it to shore so you can count everything up. So when you compare those two techniques, uh, you get a lot of data. So these are uh, for all six sites. Uh, it's a lot, it's a little overwhelming at first. So we're gonna break it down and I'm just gonna walk you through a cap point uh, in each row of each graph. So I should mention that in all of the graphs, blue, um, the blue data is always the quadrat dives and then the orange is always the hand tongs. So the first, uh, the first row here is showing you and, and all of these graphs are showing you the same information just represented differently uh, in different ways. So the first row here is showing you uh, basically the counts of oysters normalized per area, differentiated into three size bins. Uh, a lot of the a lot of agencies report out in three three size bins, so we've also reported out in three size bins. Um, but historically, our lab likes to use four size bins uh, just because uh, it gives us a little better data resolution when we're trying to look for cohort strength and different things. Um, so we've also reported that out. So again, just showing you the the count per meter squared differentiated into three and four size bins. Again, showing you the same information, but undifferentiated. So this is just a continuous size frequency distribution um, of all the oyster heights in those two uh, samples. And then we have uh, our fourth row, which is our cumulative distribution. So this is sort of where the money is at. Um, so using this cumulative distribution, um, you can run a Kolmogorov smirnov test, which basically um, is a non-parametric test um, that looks for differences in shape, spread, and median between the two sample sizes. Um, and basically allows, uh, it has the null hypothesis that the two, the two samples came from the same distribution. So it allows you to test that null hypothesis. 
Um, and so what it does is it, uh, it, it'll find it, this D value, which represents the distance at the point of greatest deviation. So for cap point one here, it's probably around 10 millimeters. Uh, it gives you that distance and then it takes the D value. So here it's 0.1, which is uh, relatively pretty low. Um, as you can see, they're sort of, they're pretty well aligned um, and it incorporates the sample size and then it gives it outputs a P value. So our P value here is 0.1, which is greater than 0.05. So we can uh, accept our null hypothesis that these uh, two samples likely came from the same population uh, distribution. So that's essentially what's going on in all of these rows. So I'm gonna open it up and we're gonna look at all of them together. Um, so again, we have cap point one, cap point two, 11 mile and cabbage top, uh, all on the same Y axis. And then when you get over to hotel bar um, and East hole, um, the, the Y axis, I just wanna note that the Y axis changed because our sample sizes were a little bit larger. And that's especially true in East hole. Um, it had almost double the sample size than any of the others, um, which actually played into um, getting, a, uh, getting a lower P value. So even though when you look at our cumulative distribution, uh, it's possibly the most well-aligned of all of them. And it also has one of the lowest D values, which means again, that the, the lines are very close together. Uh, yet we still got a, a P value below 0.05, which would tell us that they came from different populations. Um, but we think that that's a type one error because uh, the KS test is sort of notoriously sensitive to sample size. Um, so basically, the bigger the sample size, the, the easier it is for the test to find any sort of tiny discrepancy uh, in any of your data. Um, so given that it aligns really well, um, our D value is pretty low, uh, and our sample size was almost double any of the others, we think we got a, a type 1 error there. Um, for hotel bar, you can also notice that our p-value is also below 0.05. So we dug into that a little bit deeper, uh, and we ended up running a Wilcoxon, Wilcoxon rank sum test on all of our um, size bin pairs. So basically, uh, the Wilcoxon ring sum test is the non-parametric version of a t-test. So we're looking at within each size bin, um, basically seeing if there's a, a statistical difference between the dive, the quadrat dives, and the tong samples. And uh, it came back that out of all of the sample sites, only the hotel bar, um, basically oysters greater than 51 millimeters, um, had any any sort of difference. So while that is statistically significant, uh, it's not necessarily functionally significant. Um, so uh, generally, when you're managing things, um, we're we're looking we're, we're placing most of the importance on the cumulative distribution, uh, which for all of our samples are, are pretty well aligned. So quadrat diving and hand tonging uh, both have uh, limitations and advantages. Uh, and I'm just gonna walk through a couple of them here. Um, quadrat diving generally requires, um, per FWC, three, three people if you're gonna have one diver and then four people if you're gonna have two divers. Hand tonging, you really only need two people, um, one operating the tongs and then sort of a, a support staff member. Uh, for training, quadrat diving, you have to be uh, scientifically dive certified, which takes uh, a certain number of hours. Um, both in the classroom and also in the water. Hand tonging, it does require uh, a certain amount of uh, sort of on-the-job training if you've never done it before. Uh, but there is an opportunity here to sort of um, work with uh, former oystermen. They have uh, basically expert tong skills. A lot of them have been on the water for most of their lives, so they, they know what's going on. Um, they, they're really um, a valuable resource that, that could be used to, to um, to, to further hand tonging. Um, vessel size, quadrat diving, just to generally to dive, you generally need a larger boat. Hand tonging, you can use um, just a sort of smaller Carolina skiff. Uh, quadrat diving, you need all of you have to purchase and uh, maintain all of your dive equipment. Hand tonging, generally you only need a pair of tongs, <laughs> which can be um, pretty cheaply um, pretty cheaply made, uh, which goes into the cost. So we actually have quoted a couple things out uh, and just purchasing uh, basically all only the essentials that you would need to dive versus uh, what it would cost to make a pair of tongs is about five times more expensive just for purchasing and um, no maintenance or anything is included in that, uh, which gets to the maintenance piece. Um, so you have to maintain that larger boat and all of that equipment, uh, which can uh, requires more effort and also more cost. Um, and it's safety. Uh, while diving uh, is generally pretty safe, there is a certain amount of inherent, inherent risk um, when you are submerging yourself underwater. Um, so hand tonguing has a little bit, um, a little bit on the safety, has a little bit edge on the, uh, on the safety portion. 
Um, so there's also a couple environmental conditions uh, that should be considered when trying to decide uh, whether quadradiving or hand tonguing are best suited to uh, the, the situation. So tongs are only, uh, only so long, generally 13 to 14 feet. So deep waters uh, are not great for tonguing. Generally deeper than 10 feet uh, isn't so good because you still need a little, you need leverage in order to pick up everything that's in your tongs. Um, high oyster density also poses a problem for uh, hand tonguing. Um, it, basically when, tongue, when, the, when oyster geometry is really dense, so they're growing in uh, dense burrs, uh, tongs, it makes it difficult for the tongs to, to sort of be standardized and pick up everything at, at once. Uh, so that makes it a little more difficult. Uh, tonguing does have an edge when uh, it's cold outside or the water is cold because um, you don't have to get in the water. So you can sort of just bundle up and go to town with your tonguing. Uh, and there's a couple trade-offs uh, between strong winds and currents. So when you're diving, you're underwater, so strong winds aren't generally going to affect you too much, uh, but strong currents will. Um, for the tonging, you want your boat, uh, you need your boat to be stationary uh, relatively, so generally we use three anchors, uh, so you can basically make sure you're depleting the same spot every time. Um, and strong winds can make that difficult, as well as strong currents. Um, so th so there is some, so there's some trade-offs, um, and but but there's, the, there's trade-offs and there's limitations. So some key takeaways, um, tongue depletion sampling can provide a functional altern alternate to quadrant dive sampling for a lot of modern scenarios. Sorry, got some shouting. <laughs> um, overall cost, equipment, boat size requirements, uh, again, the boat equipment, uh, boat and equipment maintenance, as well as the number of people that you need and safety uh, all sort of go into play. And I, I also want to mention that uh, tongue depletion sampling, we did it with hand tongs, but it also can be applied to patent tongs, um, which we, we, we are going to look into a little bit further in the future. Uh, but again, hand tonguing sampling is a cost effective monitoring tool that can offer uh, a bunch of benefits to oyster resource managers. And I'd like to give a shout out to uh, two people. Um, so John Brucker uh, really helps. He's the uh, aquatic preserve manager for the Central Pain Handle Aquatic Preserve. Uh, and he really helped us get sort of a, a uh, grasp and give, give us a lot of really important insight on uh, quadrat diving, the sort of procedures and how they how they do it. And then Shannon Hartsfield, um, uh, a professional waterman who, without this, our sample collection and sort of standardization of our hand tonguing wouldn't be possible. Um, so that's all I've got for you guys. Um, again, my contact information here is here. It's also in the Padlet, um, and I'll take any questions if anybody's got them. Uh, nice talk. I'm just curious, do you do on how much time it takes diving versus using tongs. Is that an advantage of tonguing as well? Could, could you repeat that? Sorry, I had to turn my volume up. <laughs> yeah, did you do any comparison um, on time? So how long it takes to dive versus tonguing? Yeah, so we, we did, but we haven't done it at enough. We only did it like twice, I think. And one time, um, one time they, they switched off. So one time the tonguing took longer and then one time the, the depletions took longer. Um, so we do want to look into that a little bit further, but it's, it's on our radar. <laughs> uh, did you do any comparison of actual sample size, not with lab oysters, but the mass of the material and how that compared between the two methods? No, we haven't. Um, and I know, I know. Generally, the the dive boats will will weigh whatever they've gathered. Um, but we we haven't done any comparisons between mass. We just did the counts. How do they stay in the same place, or how do you stay in the same place when talking? How do you ensure you're talking in the same area? Yeah, so um, so we have our boat. Uh, our boat is very well anchored. So we generally have I, I, three to four anchors uh, at, whenever we're at our, our, our the site that we've gotten to. Uh, and then we also have um, basically a marker. So a, sort of a big uh, a big pole that we stick really deep into the ground uh, to hold steady and also mark. Basically, you, you, uh, whoever's operating the tongs will follow the marker down, put the tongue heads along the marker. Uh, to make sure that they're getting in the same area. And they also, you can also feel if you're in the same area with the tongs, um, but, um, so, so to make sure that you're tonguing the same spot. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, our next talk is in person and it'll be Donovan Boffman from Florida State University. And he'll be talking on salinity effects and growth on growth and shell weight of predator exposed juvenile oysters in experimental aquarium systems. My name is Donovan Bachman. I'm a PhD student at FSU and I work out of the FSU Coastal and Marine Lab. 
Um, so I wanted to talk today. Uh, yes, I want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff I've started to do for my PhD, uh, which overall is investigating the impacts of salinity on oysters through predation risk and physiology. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you is some of the kind of first trials and first rounds of some of the experiments I'm planning to keep on working on and running in the future. Um, so I think to kind of understand the motivation of my project and the purpose of these experiments, it's important to understand uh, Apalachicola Bay and its relationship with oysters, as uh, most of you are probably familiar with. Um, oysters in this region have uh, played many roles, um, first of which is an ecological importance. Um, so we've heard from previous talks already that oysters uh, serve a lot of important uh, functions in the ecosystem uh, in this region and estuary regions around the world. Um, so they're uh, water filters, they provide um, protection from coastal erosion and storm surges, um, as well as providing these complex 3D habitats that uh, hundreds of other species that are often important for recreational fishing or other purposes like to live in and use as, as habitat. Um, not only that, um, the local community of Franklin County uh, has historically been a fishery reliant community, um, relying on the oyster fishery for nearly half of the income of this region uh, at the height of the fishery. Um, so with that being said, they do play an important economic role, um, not only in the local economy of Franklin County, uh, but oysters um, from Apalachicola Bay uh, had produced 10% of all the oysters for human consumption in the U.S. prior to the collapse of the fishery. Um, so I just put this photo here to represent kind of the scale of the oyster fishery at one point in time in this region. So this is from 1956, um, so quite a ways back. But these are all just oyster shells that were, um, you know, exported and eaten or uh, possibly um, used for some other purpose. But you can see that this is, you know, a large mound of oysters. So they were exporting large quantities of, of oysters at one point from this area. But that's no longer the case. Um, as we saw this slow uh, oyster landings and a start decrease in legal and sublegal oysters beginning about 2012. And this led to a fishery disaster requiring federal assistance for the workers who relied on the fishery for financial support. Um, so there's kind of a few hypotheses as to why the oyster fishery collapsed, but there's never really been like a pinpoint or a um, decided factor. Um, so, just showing some figures here. Um, these show this top figure shows monthly oyster landings. Um, so just the amount of oysters in kilograms that oystermen are harvesting. And then the bottom one shows oyster abundance from yearly surveys. So these are fishery independent data of something like a quadrant sampling, like the previous talk was talking about. Um, so what we can see is that at the same time around 2012, halfway through 2012 to 2013, uh, on both of these figures, we see the stark decrease in uh, the, the abundance and density of oysters. Um, there's a few hypotheses that uh, are kind of out there as to why this happened, um, relating to numerous environmental and human impacts that uh, preceded this 2012 collapse. Uh, so one of which was the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, increasing harvest pressure. Um, so this oil spill that happened in 2010 um, decreased the amount of uh, oyster harvest happening in states like Texas and Louisiana that were more directly by, uh, affected by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And then so that increased harvest pressure in this region of the Gulf to kind of uh, buffer those reductions in oysters coming from other areas. Um, so we can see that on these figures here where we see that at the same time right after 2010 where this oil spill happened, we see an increase uh, of the trips being taken to go catch oysters. Uh, was, you know, way higher than it had been for the past, uh, I guess, 30 years or so, you know, so we're increasing harvest pressure at a time where we're also seeing oyster abundance decrease. And so although we're taking more trips, oystermen are also catching less oysters. And there's a few uh, hypotheses as to why this happened. Um, at this same time in 2012, as well as in 2007, uh, the United States and this region in general faced severe droughts, uh, which reduced the amount of water flowing into this estuary, increasing salinity, and allowing for increased abundance of oyster predators that like to eat uh, juvenile oysters. So um, there's a few hypotheses as to why this all happened, um, but one of the leading ones is that this low ju juvenile survival was affecting the growth of the overall population. Um, so 
the purpose of my work is to kind of investigate this effect of salinity and try to find a more mechanistic um, description of the biology behind why this could have happened. Um, so salinity affects oysters through multiple pathways. So I've already mentioned that it increases predator abundance, uh, but as well increases the predation strength of those predators on the oysters. So not only are there more of them, but they're eating uh, more oysters. So this is some work done by Dave Kimbrough et al. in 2017. And they had caged and uncaged oysters at sites um, that varied in distance from the mouth of the Apalachicola River. So they were increasing in salinity. And uh, what you can see here is that as you increase salinity, predation strength by uh, Stramonita hemostoma or southern oyster drills increases with salinity. But on top of that, oysters also experience reduced feeding um, at either low salinities or higher salinities. So this is some work done by Sandra Caseless and her team at Louisiana State. And so you can see at these lower salinities, like three, six to nine parts per thousand, we have a reduction in clearance rate, which is just the amount of uh, material that the oysters are filtering out of the water. So it's a proxy for filtration rate. And so it's a proxy for how much energy the oysters are taking in. And you also see a reduction or a slight reduction up at 25 parts per thousand. But we kind of see this, uh, the highest rate of clearance happening, you know, around 15 to 17, maybe 18 parts per thousand. So there seems to be some optimal range where oysters are filtering at the highest rate and then should be performing at the best rate in those ranges as well. Uh, on top of this, um, being outside of your uh, salinity optima can uh, impose physiological stress on the oysters just because they need to uh, regulate the cellular volume as uh, salt ions are moving in and out of their bodies. They have to expend some sort of energy to maintain homeostasis in these suboptimal conditions. All right, so it's not all doom and gloom for the oysters because there's more predators. Uh, because juvenile oysters can grow heavier and stronger shells in the presence of predators, which gives them some sort of advantage and some sort of extra protection to these heightened uh, predation environments. So this has been shown a lot with uh, other estuarine predators like stone crab, uh, stone crabs, mud crabs, and blue crabs. Um, but this has not really been investigated, investigated too much with gastropod predators, so with snail predators. Um, like the southern oyster drill that is uh, prevalent in Apalachicola Bay. I've already mentioned that these inducible defenses can reduce susceptibility to predation, but they do impose fitness trade-offs. Um, so, you know, increasing your predation may take away from other things like uh, tissue growth or reproduction, which can also affect the overall fitness of the oyster. And in Apalachicola Bay, oysters are likely to face salinity stress and predation risk simultaneously. Um, so I've already talked about how these predators are more prevalent at higher salinities, and we've heard a number of talks already talking about the concern of rising salinity in Apalachicola Bay currently and moving forward. So it is important to understand how oysters will respond to these two stressors going forward. Um, thinking about these inducible defenses and their costs of fitness, I just wanted to show a couple different examples with other uh, animals. So this figure just shows um, a normal uh, rotifer, freshwater rotifer. This is like a typical morphology, but exposed to different predators. They grow like different spines or different keels, depending on what predator they're exposed to. Um, and then barnacles, um, they don't actually change their shell too much in terms of morphology, but what they do is typically a barnacle is going to grow, you know, kind of like in a V-shape or a triangle shape with the opening at the top. Um, but when exposed to gastropod predation, barnacles grow this bent morphology, uh, which makes it harder for the snail to eat them. But we also see a reduction uh, by 50% in the amount of eggs produced by these barnacles just by growing this bent morphology. So the top figure shows that although they're not actually changing the mass of their shell, they're just changing the shape of their shell, and it's still uh, resulting in a 50% reduction in offspring. Um, this also happens in terrestrial habitats. So this is a, a song sparrow. And uh, so what we see here is that female song sparrows that were exposed to a cause of predatory birds during the nesting season, um, to, uh, regardless of what stage their nests were at, so if they were eggs, hatchling, or fledgling birds, uh, we saw a reduction in offspring per nest uh, all the way through the, the nesting season. So um, we can see that defending from predation is helpful, right, because you're, you're reducing your risk of dying, but it can also be um, possibly, right? You might produce less offspring, which can still reduce your overall fitness and the population. All 
right? So the kind of overall goal of my whole dissertation is to look at these combined effects of suboptimal salinity and predation risk on the energetic allocation of oysters because, uh, I'm sorry. All right. Because I've mentioned how oysters have this reduced feeding and suboptimal salinities. So if we think about um, a general type of energetic budget of an oyster, we're going to have food coming in. We're going to lose some of the food, uh, just excretion. And then so we're going to be able to take in some of this food that can be used for different uh, physiological processes. Right. So we have, uh, I like to think of these boxes as being dynamic so they can change in size. Okay. So if we have uh, a limited acquisition of energy due to reduced feeding, our overall food box is just going to get smaller and now we have less to go around. Okay, so now this oyster has to make decisions between um, allocating between growth, defense, and reproduction, but as well as just maintaining homeostasis. Uh, so there are costs associated with not growing, but just the stuff you need to do to stay alive. Like if for humans, just breathing in and keeping yourself upright, you know, so you have to pay these costs before you can do these things. Um, so changes to this allegation, allocation will then have some sort of impacts on growth, survival, and reproduction, depending on how these boxes shift. So if we're putting more uh, energy into defense so we can uh, have a higher chance of surviving predation, we might reduce the size of our growth box, or maybe we reduce the size of our reproduction box, with both have, with both, which both have different impacts on the population. Uh, so if the oysters are growing slower, uh, we might see them take longer to reach market size, which affects the, the oyster market. And if they're reproducing less, this just re uh, reduces the overall amount of oyster larvae entering the greater population. Um, so kind of as a first step, I just wanted to see if different salinities actually affect uh, the shell growth of juvenile oysters that are exposed to predators or not. All right, so to do this, I had um, these experimental tank systems that I set up at the marine lab. So I had 12 of those um, at low, medium, or high salinity. And then, so you can kind of see in this figure, I had the oysters spat or the juveniles up top in these tanks, and they were each tagged so I could track individuals. Um, and then in the bottoms, in these sumps, I had adult oysters and uh, predators. So I had oyster drills in the predator present tanks, but then in the predator absent tanks, I just had the adult oysters to account for effects of filtration and, and those types of things. All right, so I had these 12 tanks, and in each tank, I put 20 of these oysters. Um, the salinity ranges were from 8 to 15, 8 to 25, and 28 to 35 parts per thousand, uh, which I used a combination of sources uh, for the salinity ranges in Apalachicola Bay to determine. And then they were either exposed to the presence or absence of predator cues. And so this gave me a total of two replicate systems per salinity and treatment combination. So for example, this could have been like the low salinity with predator, low salinity, no predator. And then I just fed the oysters uh, frozen selfish diet per the manufacturer's instructions, but I actually doubled these rations so that I could uh, be sure that there was no issues with food availability. Um, and I did have some complications setting up the experiment. Um, so for the high salinity treatment with no predator, I only have one tank. Um, so You'll see this show up in the variability on the graphs I'll show um, because my sample size was a lot lower for that tank. Um, so some of the metrics I tracked were whole oyster wet weight. And so all of these figures that I'm gonna present on the next three slides look very similar to this with our salinity regime on the bottom, low, medium, and high, and then whatever uh, response variable we're measuring on the y-axis. And then uh, our predator treatments here. So predator absent treatments will always be the red dots and predator present treatments will always be the blue dots, and the bars represent 95% confidence intervals. Um, so what we see from this graph is clearly that the oysters in the low salinity treatment that were exposed to predators uh, grew way more than any other oyster uh, at any other combination. So they were nearly two and a half times heavier in low salinity predator present than the predator absent treatment, as well as all of these other combinations. So overall, the predator exposed juvenile oysters grew more in low salinity, than medium or high salinity. We see a similar pattern with dry shell weight, where we have the highest shell weight at low salinity, uh, and then we have reduced shell weight in the other combinations, with about a 29% in, or a 29% difference in shell weight between predator exposed and non-exposed oysters. And so overall, the dry shell weight of uh, predator exposed juveniles was greater in low salinity uh, than medium and high. 
Um, so I didn't think that that was too surprising, right? Because if you have a, a heavier oyster or a larger oyster overall, they're probably going to have a heavier or larger shell as well, right? Just because as you get bigger, you need more material. But so what I wanted to do was look at the shell weight in relation to the shell area of the oyster um, with the idea in mind that an oyster that's the same weight, but maybe has a larger area would then have a lower thickness. All right, so it's a proxy for shell thickness. And so what we see here is another similar pattern where we have the highest shell thickness in the predator uh, present treatment at low salinity, uh, with those shells being about 14% thicker than non-exposed oysters from the same salinity treatment. And so overall, the shell thickness was greatest in low salinity, predator exposed oyster treatments. Um, so from this, we see that predator exposed juveniles increase their whole body weight, their shell weight, and their shell thickness compared to the non-exposed juveniles in low salinity conditions. Some possible explanations for this are that the oysters increase their growth rate to reach a size refuge from predation more quickly. So if you grow bigger, faster, you have less susceptibility to predation. Uh, but this should require greater food acquisition, right? You're going to need more energy to grow faster and larger. Uh, the other possibility uh, that I think is unlikely but possible is that the constantly alive oysters that were not exposed to predators uh, they were allowed to constantly eat that algae that I was feeding to the whole system. So it is possible that those constantly alive oysters ate more food out of that system than the dying oysters who were being replaced every once in a while. Um, I don't think that's an issue because if that was, we would expect to see, for example, um, like in this figure, if uh, that was true, we would expect to see these oysters and the other treatments also have higher weights if they're taking in more food but that's not something we see, so that's why I don't think it's really that much of an issue. Um, so these results suggest some restriction on growth in the medium and high salinity conditions. Um, could this be due to a reduced clearance rate or feeding rate that I talked about at the beginning of the talk? Or it could also be um, just due to the higher maintenance costs that the oysters are having to pay in those uh, higher salinities. So to be continued, I'm gonna do some clearance rate uh, trials to look at energetic acquisition and food density. And then same for respiration effects, so I can get an idea of the homeostatic maintenance costs that the oysters are paying in these different treatments. Then I'm going to modify the take setup so I can more than double my replication and minimize any uh, worries about tank effects. Then I'm going to do long-term uh, experiments in the field uh, where I expose the oysters to predators and not to predators uh, and let them grow to adult size and then measure things like shell thickness and uh, gonad mass tissue weight to look at these allocation shifts. And uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you to everybody at the Marine Lab and uh, all the people who helped out. And yeah, Curtis Himmel for supplying me with the oysters. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, I would like to do subtitle and intertitle because oyster drills, the ones I tested these on, they're subtitle predators. Um, but there's another oyster predator, crown conchs, that are intertidal predators. Uh, they're also gastropod snails. Um, so I want to do both. Yeah. Two questions. Um, what was the timeline for the observations? Of, I may have missed it. Um, for, for the um, so what do you mean timeline? Like how long did you observe the- Oh, eight the, weeks. Yeah, eight weeks. eight weeks. Okay. And then do you think there's any uh, response to having a non-specific adult oyster in the predator tank uh, yeah. that could be influencing shelf and growth or anything like that? Um, That's a good question. Uh, so there's a couple papers that have tried to look at that, but what they did is they, they put crushed oyster shells with predators and then crushed oyster shells by themselves mm -hmm. out in the field. And then they looked at settlement of the larval oysters. Um, so what they saw is that there was higher settlement when it was just the crushed oyster shell and then lower settlement when it was crushed oyster shell and predators. So there, there might be some part of an effect there, but um, I'm more concerned with like the, the predator aspect of this, mm -hmm. but uh, going forward, I was going to uh, take the oyster out of the tank completely uh, and just feed the snails in a separate tank and then move them into the predator tanks. Mm -hmm. And then so it kind of eliminates the possibility of that question. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any, um, I guess, tolerances for predators under the incidences that would feed less? Yes, yeah, so the oyster drills do feed more at higher salinities. Um, so 
there, there is the idea that there could be like a higher predator queue in the higher salinity water. Um, and that's something that I was kind of concerned with uh, at the start of this experiment, but after looking at the results, it doesn't really seem like that is too much of an issue, um, but it is something to think about for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, have you also thought about how uh, predators and their um, predation increases with slurry, but also with temperature, and so does pathogens, uh, mm -hmm. so the are not the rate of infection increases with Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I definitely do think about that. Um, so that's like one of the things I was thinking about with that first study I showed with uh, Dave Kimbrough's predation strength figure is that that figure was um, just cage versus uncaged oysters, and they were looking for shell damage. So um, anything that had did not have shell damage, like if it was like a crushing predator, they would attest that mortality to a snail predator but it is possible that it was something like dermo or some parasitic infection that's not really visible through the show. So that would be a concern for me, like more. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Right, next up we have Emily White from McIntosh High School, and she'll be talking on sustainable habitats for Crossaria virginica using particle image velocimetry to analyze oyster larvae movement. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Uh, as for that wonderful introduction, my name is Emily White, and I am from McIntosh High School, which is in Georgia. So a little bit of a drive to get here. Um, but uh, I have been uh, interested in uh, uh, I have been interested in um, oyster growth and conservation for like Four years now. It's a very niche subject. My high school friends are um, two of them are wonderful here with me today, but um, it's a very niche subject. I uh, go by Oyster Girl at my high school. Um, but uh, I got interested in oyster conservation when I actually came here to Apalachicola with my dad on a little field trip he was doing for um, teachers in his county. And I came here to the reserve and I learned um, a lot more about some of the you know issues that were happening in the area and um, some of the conservation issues, and I was really interested, and I wanted to do something to help, and I had the wonderful opportunity of science school to start doing that, and so um, the first year that I started studying this, um, I wanted to look specifically at, actually, this was technically the second year. The first year, I wanted to start looking at um, artificial oyster reefs because I thought it was really cool that something man-made could support the ecosystem in such a huge way. And so the first year what I did was I looked to see, to make sure that there was no water quality issues when I add, I wanted to add oyster shell into a, a quick creek concrete mix because that was something that I had read, readily available access to, it was cheap, and uh, other concrete mixes had proved to be um, beneficial in the past so I thought okay what if I added oyster shell into the mix just to see what happened and so the first year I was running the experiment in the back of my science teacher's classroom I had six Home Depot buckets with little bubblers in it and I was going to take uh, data every day just to measure temperature, uh, pH, dissolved oxygen, all of the most important things and the results were what I expected. It didn't affect anything much, which was, you know, they've already been using the field, so that's what I thought. But then the next year, what I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, actually come and work at the Florida State University's Coastal Marine Lab, and I worked with my wonderful mentor, Chris Matichik, Um, and I um, built uh, 54 bricks and of this concrete oyster shell material. And basically what I did was I made different ratios of oyster shell to concrete mix because I wanted to see if as you increase the oyster shell would um, spout recruitment rates increase as well. And uh, I was able to do this with um, wonderful funding from um, Yamaha Motors, which is in my hometown. Um, they bought everything for me. And then the best part about this was that I was able to work with uh, the freshmen that are in my STEM program at my school. So I was able to work my construction into their construction curriculum and get them involved in the conservation effort. And to this day, some of them still come back and ask me how are the oysters doing, you know, which was, that was a really fun part for me. And so after we built um, all of the, the 54 blocks, then I came down to the um, FSU CML and I deployed them in nine different replicates. 
And um, because of logistic purposes, I wasn't able to take as much data as I would like, but I just came back down um, in November to collect SPAC counts. And um, the results were not what I wanted, which is okay. It still means something. Uh, basically, uh, we saw no statistical, statistical difference between uh, the ratios of concrete, you know, adding more oyster shell um, into the concrete did not affect higher SPAC counts or anything. But there were some issues that could have confounded um, because I was working with a freshman at my high school, they weren't the most skilled uh, con construction agents. Um, so they definitely, there was, you know, some variability as you can uh, see here in this wonderful, uh, this definitely broke in the truck on the way down here. Um, but uh, so that could have been a problem. Um, the, the main problem though was that I believe I missed the spat fall by like about a month. So there wasn't as much spat in the area as I officially uh, originally wanted. Um, and then the, uh, another main problem was barnacles. There were so many competing barnacles that it was honestly kind of hard to find the spat, which was a fun challenge. Um, but those are just some kind of sources of possible error. But it really looked like what I had started out with, you know, the idea of adding uh, oyster shells to concrete wasn't doing what I wanted it to. So I decided to move on to something which I think is cooler. Uh, this cat is named Bieber, by the way. He was um, very, uh, a very vital component of building the oyster reefs for sure. Um, so what I wanted to look at in my um, second year of studying this was um, hydrodynamics and turbulent flow because I was going into my AP Physics 2 course at my school and one of the big topics is fluid dynamics and I thought that that was awesome. And um, I was just learning more about it and I was thinking, you know, how all these things connect into oyster reef development because I had also learned from Dr. Sandra about um, issues with the spat placement that had gone on at Peanut Ridge just because it was a good environment but there was lots of turbulent flow and they kind of got washed away. So I was thinking about that and maybe um, there's a way to incorporate, incorporate these ideas together to maybe make an oyster reef that was better fit for turbulent conditions, um, maybe. And uh, I also just wanted to continue collaborating with other research institutions, so that was great. And then after working with the freshman, um, the first year that I did this, I wanted to continue with that whole student idea because I am a young scientist myself and I wanted to uh, continue supporting other students that were interested in things like this. And I actually, um, I'm the first student in my county to um, do independent research for a work-based learning program. So basically I'm in charge of my own research and I have a period, technically two periods of my class day that I just work by myself or I go over to my middle school and I mentor um, middle schoolers in the STEM program over there, which is so cool. They are so interested in science and it's amazing. Um, and then also something that I've been interested in, in the past was doing a sort of more an anthropological approach, you know, acknowledging the importance of community and how community is intrinsically, intrinsically tied to the environment, especially here in Apalachicola, you know, with the generations of oystermen and how important their environment is to them. And so I kind of wanted to start doing something where I uh, document how the environment has shaped the community. And I'm still in the process of working on that, hoping to do some collaborations with the local library here and set up some interviews with business owners in the area. Um, but to start, I scored a uh, position at the uh, BAMLA lab at Georgia Tech, which is a uh, chemical and biomedical engineering lab, which originally you would think that doesn't really tie into what I was doing, but they were actually a really great place to start exploring um, hydrodynamics and um, fluid dynamics and some uh, 3D modeling. So it was really great. Um, my mentor, Jonathan O'Neill, he was a graduate student and he uh, was very helpful in letting me use all of their uh, 3D modeling equipment and their um, particle image velocimetry equipment, and it was awesome. Um, so here I'm using a resin 3D printer because I actually uh, did a thing called photogrammetry, which is the coolest thing I've ever done. You take, I took an oyster shell to do this, but you hang the oyster shell off of something and then you take like 10 million photos of it and then you put it through this program called Mesh Mixer and it produces an STL file that you can then print with a 3D printer. So that's what I was doing here. Uh, here's the actual file up at the top. It, it literally looks like that, like it's so spot on, it's amazing. And so what I wanted to do, and I also experimented with making gelatin molds here of a natural oyster shell because what I wanted to do was um, take more a natural approach to creating an artificial oyster reef and just experiment with a bunch of technology and see what worked best. Um, and so 
after making those molds and working with the photogrammetry, I started um, with particle image velocimetry, which uh, you can see in this little tank here. There'll be more videos later, but um, it that's by far like the coolest thing I've ever done. It's so cool. Um, and here, there we go. Uh, I hope I don't. I hope the video will play. So, oh my gosh. Okay, never mind. Uh, we'll continue. Uh, how do I? How do I I'll tap a couple times until you see the. Oh, tap. There we go. That's one. Okay. Uh, so unfortunately, this is a really cool, uh, uh, like three D scope of the model that I made. Um, but this is really just you can see it in the the photo over here, just to show you how incredibly accurate it was. Uh, and it was really cool to be able to print it because I could go and show my friends and be like, "See this oyster shell? No, I have to." Um, um, but yeah, so that was that. And then uh, so. Particle image velocity is my favorite part of this project. It is so interesting. Um, and I actually learned about it by uh, discussing with Dr. Andy Chance, which I think was referenced in the last uh, presentation. He was uh, really excited to see maybe how this could be used in, um, in relation to uh, oyster reefs and kind of analyzing um, hydrodynamic variables around oyster reefs. And so basically what it is, is it's using lasers to illuminate nanoparticles as they move through medium. So um, in my case, I kind of, after I stopped working at Georgia Tech over the summer, because I just didn't have time during the school year, I had to kind of make a setup of my own at home. So um, thanks to Amazon for um, the laser that I used and uh, finding the, the nanoparticles online, that was the hardest part, was finding the orange nanoparticles. Um, but uh, so what I did is I kind of set it up in a little tank in my kitchen with um, a white backdrop just to better illuminate things. And I mixed a certain amount of nanoparticles into the medium and then illuminated it with a laser. And then you take a slow-mo video and then you can run that video through PIV lab to analyze them for um, vorticity, velocity, angular speed of the particles. And it gives you some really amazing um, visuals of what the particles are doing in the medium. Um, and I did have a slow-mo video of you, for you guys to watch, but I don't know if that will work now. <laughs> but uh, so what I wanted to do here is there have been some studies done on um, with this technology with natural oyster reefs. Um, but with my interest in artificial oyster reefs, I wanted to kind of take that and apply it to my field. So I wanted to look at just regular uh, concrete blocks just just for a baseline. And then um, when I was at Georgia Tech, I 3D printed a reef model, uh, which was really cool. It's like a little mini oyster reef. Um, so I was going to use that one as well. And then the 3D printed shell. And um, I was going to use uh, crushed limestone pieces, which are becoming more of a popular substrate. Um, and I actually got mine donated from a uh, local quarry. Um, and then the one of my favorite parts of this project was I collaborated with a, um, a business in the Netherlands uh, called BC Elements, and they sent me a sample of their um, potato, potato starch um, artificial oyster reef like mesh thing. It's very cool. I have a picture of it on the next slide. Um, but they, so they sent that over to me, and I'm gonna, I really wanted to study that one specifically because the shape is just so different in comparison to other things on the market. Um, and so hopefully when I, I, when I take these videos, I'll analyze the vectors produced, and I'll compare them to see um, if there's any relation between certain variables and um, spat recruitment success. Um, and so the goal, the, the big future goal is to use these patterns to design a reef that could shelter spat from stronger currents or use the currents to kind of guide them to settle on the reef. Because when I was at Georgia Tech, I saw um, one of the postdocs there was studying um, flamingo feet. And he was using the same technology, but he was observing how when the foot goes down in the water, it creates a vortice and they swirl the food into their mouth. And so I was thinking about something similar in the scope of uh, oysters. Um, but here is the BC Elements potato starch that um, they so kindly donated to me. Um, I'm so excited to work with it. It looks so cool. Um, it, but as you can see, it's a very different geometry than other, um, other um, reefs that I mentioned before. Um, and then I don't know if you can see the slow-mo video, but you can kind of see here, these are the particles that were eliminated. And so when the video plays, I don't know. No, it won't play. Um, but when you take the video, you can actually watch the particles swirl around. Um, and when you upload this into PID lab, uh, this one was with the, um, the rocks from the quarry. But when you upload them into PID lab, you can um, 
make a lot of different graphs like this. I am very, um, this program is kind of overwhelming and I'm still learning how to use it effectively. Um, but this is one of my favorite graphs because I did this with um, the 3D printed oyster reef and these are streamlines. So you can really see how the particles are actually moving and what the, the voices that are being created. And then you can look at vorticity, which is just how it swirls, which I think is just really awesome. Um, and so that is kind of the end of the research as of right now, because um, when I started reading more about particle image velocity, it got very confusing really fast. So I'm still trying to learn more, but I'm so excited to continue working. And um, I have some great things set up in the future, um, working with, uh, once again, with Yamaha Motors. They have uh, old wave runner parts that they want to recycle into some sort of um, coral, oyster, mussel reef. So I'm gonna work with that as well, possibly including this technology. Um, but the absolute best part of, I know that I've said there's like five different best parts of this experience, but um, I, love working with um, the students, the young scientists, because I was one of them myself. And the only reason that I'm here is because um, my teachers and my mentors listened to my crazy ideas and let me explore. Um, when I was in ninth grade, I told my science teacher that I wanted to test concrete tensile strength using a fire hose by just blasting it with a fire hose. And he was like, sure, go for it. Um, and so I wouldn't have been able to continue any of this without the support of my mentors and it's really an amazing opportunity to come back with this technology and some resources and connections that I have and help my my middle school students so here here's one of my favorite classes um he one of them is interested uh they do this thing called invention convention and one of them is interested in creating um some sort of goggle that's uh, made for use in space and so I, um, gonna, I'm going to get him for next to an astronaut that I know and have them work together. I'm so excited about that. And then um, ignore my friend's amazing face in that photo. He can't take a normal photo to save his life. Um, but these are some uh, high schoolers that are working with me as well and then my wonderful um, middle school STEM teacher. But um, it's really awesome to be able to share these experiences with young students and watch them have their own amazing incredible ideas and be able to just kind of help foster um, their curiosity and creativity with some of the things that I've learned over the years. Um, so yeah, and my wonderful uh, mentors and references over the years. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm super excited where, with where this is going. I can't wait to learn more. And me being a senior um, in high school, I just committed to Georgia Tech. So uh, I will be uh, continuing all of my uh, work in their new environmental science uh, major. So I'm very excited to continue. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is cool. larval settlement and survival on the media for comparison with the PID nanoparticles. Also, might the use of shell and concrete have better opportunity to allow the shell to create surface area for larval settlement, i.e., have shells sticking out from the bricks, cumbersome to deploy, but could be handled from the bottom. Yes. Uh, so um, when I was, uh, we'll start with the, the oyster shell question in the concrete first. Um, I used crushed oyster shell that I was able to get from Tractor Supply. It was used as like a uh, chicken calcium supplement for hens that were producing eggs. And I used that because it was cheap and Yamaha was able to go buy it for me. So uh, I would have really loved to use larger pieces, but unfortunately just with uh, my resources, I wasn't able to do that. But I think that that would work better in the future, more of like a tabby-like structure. Um, and then, yes, the end goal is to uh, analyze uh, those fat recruitment and survival rates in comparison to hydrodynamic variables. Um, I'm hoping that I, uh, Dr. Chance and I had discussed um, using spat from one of the hatcheries and perhaps um, using it in the, the water columns of the lab. Um, I just haven't had a whole lot of time my senior year to get back down here and do things like that, but that is the end goal. Right? This is great. Any other questions? Okay, so we have one more question.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the final session of the symposium. Um, my name is Michael Falandri. I work in the research department here at the Reserve. And for our first speaker of the session is going to be Rick Harder with WSP. And he's going to be giving us an update on the Franklin 98 Living Shoreline Project. Okay, so uh, my name is Rick Harder. Uh, I am with WSP USA. I'm a coastal restoration specialist. Uh, before we uh, get started, I wanted to thank the Apalachicola NUR. Uh, uh, the NUR and its staff have been such huge supporters of this Franklin 98 project since the very beginning. Um, so thanks very much. Also want to introduce Evan Blythe, who is the project manager with the Appalach uh, Appalachian Regional Planning Council. He's there in the room with you today. So Evan, please uh, say hello. Um, and it, uh, I, I've been able to uh, enjoy most of the symposium so far, some amazing presentations. And uh, I, I just have to say, just the titles alone are so intimidating. Everybody's got these very uh, interesting academic titles. And here we have just you know Franklin 98. So I'm going to uh, retitle this as uh, uh, the collaborative role of public and non-public organizations in utilizing a complex biomimicking shoreline stabilization technique to address chronic erosion, habitat loss, and fishery impacts. That's our subtitle. We're just going to uh, hit on a few things here today. Uh, just a background on the project. We're going to talk a little bit about the data that went into uh, the design and monitoring of the project, uh, some key design considerations, uh, and uh, touch on the uh, pilot uh, study that we did looking at different uh, innovative materials and um, really talk about the, where we ended up with the design and, um, and what's next. So here's some background. Uh, this is St. George Sound. Uh, there's a 12 mile section of shoreline here outlined in the red rectangle. That uh, indicates our initial study area for the Franklin 98 grant and the, the feasibility study that we've looked at. Um, we had lots of stakeholder engagement, um, public meetings, webinars, and so on. Uh, and as a result of the, the, the background data collection that we were getting, our, our coastal modeling efforts, you can see an example of our modeling uh, down on the bottom right. Um, and just field observations, uh, lots of different factors. Probably most importantly, though, being uh, property owner interest. Uh, we adjusted the actual project footprint to be this western or southwestern uh, half of the project steady area. So this green rectangle is, is ultimately, we trimmed it back and said, okay, you know what, really only looking at doing something in that area. So that is essentially from the uh, about 10th Street, which is, uh, or Avenue, which is just east of the East Point Breakwater. Uh, from there over to Yent Bayou. We don't intend on doing anything at Yent Bayou or east of Yent Bayou. Uh, the, it, here, here's a zoomed in view of that. So essentially we're just looking at the shoreline uh, along here which is right along Highway 98. And as many of you have seen, as you've driven it, uh, you, many places, the roadway is very close to the water. Uh, there's all sorts of different efforts that have been used over time. Everything from old timber bulkheads uh, to concrete rubble uh, and rock placed along the shoreline. Uh, even you can see in the bottom left here, uh, most recently is the uh, uh, articulated concrete block mat uh, so DOT has constantly been battling this, trying to um, uh, keep the chronic erosion from uh, creating more damage to the roadway. Uh, here on the right, you can see a series of seawalls that, you know, really even the newest seawall is is beyond its its lifespan. It's 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 uh, in need of repair, you know. And that's one of the challenges with uh, this type of gray infrastructure is uh, when it gets damaged. It doesn't repair itself, but uh, oyster reefs and salt marsh can provide added protection and they also can uh, adjust to changing conditions and repair themselves after storms. Uh, so that's that's the background for this project. Uh, it's funded 
initially funded by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection for a feasibility study, um, and then uh, now is fully funded with uh, two different grants from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the Gulf Environmental Benefit Fund, and the Emergency Coastal Resilience Fund. Um, and the goal of the project is to create 20, uh, up to 20 acres of new reef and 30 acres of marsh uh, with the purpose of helping to stabilize the shoreline for resiliency, uh, providing added ecosystem services, uh, and, and really also uh, it's, it's gonna bring in a lot of uh, um, economic development into the community, just in terms of the actual project itself, the construction of the project, uh, but the outcome of the project, higher productivity for the fishery, um, better ecotourism opportunities, uh, better aesthetics for the shoreline, and so on. Uh, I kind of already touched on that. Uh, we collected all sorts of data, even before doing any kind of construction, uh, wave data, water level data, uh, um, sediment data, mapping of seagrasses, uh, and so on. We, again, and we had lots of different um, public engagement uh, where we obtained information from stakeholders. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, design considerations that really drove the design on this. Uh, they're listed here. Seagrass coverage is a huge one. Of course, wave climate, water depth. Uh, of course, there's regulatory considerations in terms of permitting. Um, and and uh, stakeholder input as far as you know property owners what they want to see what people uh, in the community want to see. Uh, we also met with uh, the Florida Department of Transportation so that they know what we've been doing all along uh, to get their input. And speaking of Florida Department of Transportation, one of the interesting observations that uh, we made along the way because. We've been looking at this this whole stretch of shoreline uh, for years now, very in-depth, lots of different data sets, um, lots of different aerials, including drone aerials, LIDAR, uh, annual LIDAR, uh, looking at elevation changes. Um, and one of the things we really notice is that these drainage outfalls, uh, there's a pretty strong correlation between the road damage after Hurricane Michael and where those outfalls are. So even if an outfall isn't right at the edge of the roadway, that was those are places where overtopping was occurring, um, probably some flooding coming over the road from the from these, you know, the drainage itself, um, and very frequently we're seeing a, a correlation between those. So that's just something that we were keeping in mind as we were uh, working, and and really, and this really hasn't been. Uh, dug into quite as much as I'd like to see, but uh, maybe it's an opportunity for research for one of you. That is, uh, with these outfalls, they're bringing in fresh water, and in a lot of cases, the uh, the the oyster populations are uh, really stressed by predators. So having that uh, wider range of salinity, maybe there could be a uh, uh, some effect of, of uh, keeping the predator populations a little lower at those outfalls. Uh, so next I want to touch on this test materials update. So um, really starting back when we were doing our feasibility study, uh, we became aware of the product uh, that is uh, uses um, vegetative uh, material in the form of jute twine uh, soaked in concrete and formed into different shapes. Uh, Sandbar Oyster Company was a company that we uh, had talked to and their product they call Oyster Catcher. Uh, and they have it shaped in different uh, different types of shapes. And we wanted to put some of that stuff out to see how does it do in terms of um, durability? How does it do in terms of recruitment? And how does it compare to uh, rocks or oyster shells, which are you know more conventional materials? And so, uh, you know, here's some pictures that, that this one they call lollipops. It's got a circle at the top of it. These are some uh, earlier on photos. Uh, on the left, they've got these straight ones they call rastas. It looks like a, uh, some dreadlocks. 
Uh, the middle ones are tabletops. This is two of them stacked on top of each other. They're very light colored here because this is the moment that they were installed before they had even been submerged yet. And then again on the right is the, the lollipops. So uh, the Rastas and the lollipops were deployed oh, about eight months before the tabletops. Um, and so you can get a, a picture there. Um, and so they were all deployed in 2020. And let me show you some pictures of kind of what they look like then versus now. Uh, so this is after they had been in for some, actually this one went in, uh, yeah, this one's, you know, about a year after it was put in. And uh, you can see that the, there, there's a lot of sediment at this particular site uh, that has essentially buried a lot of what we had. These, these uh, boxes here, those are plastic, um, uh, milk crates filled with rocks or oyster shells and you know for the most part there's a lot of burial that that we saw uh, some of the some of the oyster catching materials are still there some of them are gone uh, you know they they you know there were there was a delay from the time that they were manufactured to the time they were put in that was really longer than the than the manufacturer intended so there there was some uh, additional brittle brittleness to the uh, materials, but uh, and that probably explains a lot of the breakage. Uh, I do know that one one of our sites, uh, it looked like a a log that we saw near the shoreline had swept across and broken some off as well. Uh, so that was something to consider. And so you, you can see the the larger oyster numbers at least. You know, look at uh, how many oysters we're getting now. And uh, particularly on the, uh, the the lollipops, you, here you can still see the open hole, but they've completely closed in in most cases now. Uh, and then similarly, uh, and now these are two different ones, but because this one's a single and this one has uh, two stacked, but they're representative of what we're seeing. So uh, the the tabletops are just completely covered. The space that's provided between the two of them uh was you know completely filled in with oysters it was, it was great in terms of predator protection so anyways we we did look at uh, a lot of different uh materials and there's new ones coming out every day i saw some amazing uh products yesterday online that i thought man i'd love to try those uh but really uh durability was a huge um consideration uh especially with the funder uh, and so ultimately we settled on the majority of the materials being rocks uh, or recycled concrete if they're recycled in a way that they look like natural rocks, you know, not big flat pieces, not pieces with rebar sticking out or paint or tiles or things like that. You know, it shouldn't look like trash, shouldn't look like debris, should look like rocks. And these are all rocks that are out there. Actually, these uh pieces of the revetment that have kind of washed out into uh, deeper areas. Uh, some cases they're rocks, some cases they're recycled concrete. Uh, in looking at our, uh, our monitoring data, really not seeing a huge difference in recruitment, uh, colonization on the different materials between the rocks and the concrete. Um, here's another uh, picture you can see. Again, a lot of this is, is concrete. Um, these are rocks, and you can really see there's that, that what we call the sweet spot, or what I call the sweet spot, that perfect elevation uh, where uh, it's just below the waterline. This is at a lower tide, and you get that really dense colonization of uh, oysters. So you know, we know that the, the uh, we, we know that we can get good recruitment and colonization um, and growth within our study area. Uh, you know, as long as we're putting the materials at the right elevation. So elevation really drove things pretty heavily. Uh, this is a representative uh, aerial of what the project area looks like. You can see there's extensive seagrass beds out here, these dark areas. Um, and then at the intertidal zone, mostly, uh, it almost exclusively is, is unvegetated. Uh, and then there's a lot of bare areas uh, that are submerged. And so our approach, it is 
is uh, well, I'll dig in a, a little bit more in terms of our mosaic approach. It's not just a linear breakwater like a lot of living shorelines. Um, due primarily to regulatory reasons uh, and uh, just our permitting process, uh, we have uh, taken a phased approach um, so that these publicly owned parcels here, this is at Franklin County School, and then these two here are uh, part of Tate's Health State Forest. Uh, we're gonna start with those areas because in order for the project to be constructed, we need to sign off from uh, the property owners. So this will give us an oppor opportunity to have a, a demonstration phase and then folks can uh, sign on for that. So as we were kind of finalizing the design for phase one, we, uh, th this green hatched area here is, is seagrass. Uh, the bright green solid color is proposed marsh. And then these gray areas around it are uh, proposed reef. And we, we took this design and we simplified it a little bit so that we didn't end up with very small isolated reefs out here, primarily for uh, navigability. And so we um, kind of simplified it down to more of just this design here. These So this is essentially a marsh sill. It's gonna uh, be at an elevation that is ideal for the oysters uh, and be protecting an area that's ideal for salt marsh uh, development. So that, that was at the school. Uh, this is the middle site, uh, Tate's Hill State Forest. It's a different scale here because it's a bigger site. Uh, so everything's a little smaller on this map. Same deal, um, except with this one, we you can see there's lots of proposed uh, reefs out here. These numbers, by the way, are water depths. So minus three feet. Uh, NAVD. Uh, so that one was simplified some, but we still, but we do have some of these offshore reefs out here. <clears throat> There's a small reef right here that's going to be actually made up of uh, uh, hollow concrete reef domes. Like, you know, you might have seen something uh, like reef balls or oyster domes, uh, different types of products out there. Uh, there's going to be a small one out here that's yeah, you know, more as a demonstration, but in terms of cost effectiveness, the rocks were really uh, the way to go. And then the easternmost site, uh, if you're wondering what this big blue triangle is, uh, that's an area that we didn't have uh, good seagrass mapping data for. So rather than assuming that there's not any seagrass there, we assume that there is seagrass there. Um, and so that was kind of simplified down to this design here. Um, and that's pretty much it in terms of the design and where we are. Uh, this is a uh, artist rendition uh, on the left is is what it looks like now minus the, uh, uh, the construction barrels those have been removed, but that's basically what it looks like. And in the future, after the project has uh, been fully constructed, and, or at least this area is fully constructed and the oysters have a chance to get established. Let's say, you know, give it a few years after construction and the marsh has a chance to get established and fills in, uh, again, probably, you know, let's say five years. Uh, you know, it should look a lot more like what you see on the right side of the screen. Uh, as far as the status of the project, uh, we are in year three right now. Uh, we do expect to begin construction uh, this spring, um, and the the the, con a, the contracting process, a contractor uh, or request for bids went out. Uh, contractor ranking and selection was made. Uh, they're in the process of uh, negotiating the contract now. And again, we hope to uh, hope to see that uh, construction work begin very soon. Um, all along, we've been doing monitoring, pre-construction monitoring uh, with a consistent monitoring plan, uh, which will continue throughout construction and after construction so that we can uh, help 
characterize uh, the performance of the project. And, um, and, and then, yeah, uh, construction will continue with additional phases. Uh, we have a phase two right now that is uh, close to being set as far as which areas along the shoreline we can do where property owners have said, yeah, sign me up. You know, that they don't have to do anything other than sign the application uh, for the permit that says, yeah, that they're, they'll, they will allow it. Uh, doesn't cost anything, uh, but they can see lots of benefits from it. And then finally, another uh, kind of artist rendition of uh, what it might look like with the roadway. Uh, instead of being so vulnerable and having uh, the, the water so close to the road's edge uh, and having, you know, many would consider an unattractive pile of broken concrete, uh, there would be some some marsh and reef. In most cases, you probably won't be able to see the reef because of the marsh, uh, but the marsh isn't going to be so high that you can't see the bay either. So with that, I will take questions, and I really wish I had my... Uh, audio working. All right, so for our next speaker is going to be Rachel Best Thank from you. Florida State University. Uh, and she's going to be presenting on the role of phenotypic plasticity in a species of octocoral in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Thanks. Um, good morning, my name is Rachel and I am a PhD candidate at Florida State University in Don Levitan's lab in the Department of Biological Sciences. So I'm going to talk to you a bit today about some of my dissertation work that takes place a little bit outside of Apalachicola Bay, um, and it looks at the role that phenotypic plasticity plays in a common species of octocoral. And so species vary often um, within populations, and this can be due to genetic differences or also phenotypic plasticity. And so phenotypic plasticity is defined as one one genotype expresses different phenotypes in different environments. So this is not a new phenomenon or an uncommon one, but let me start by giving you a few examples. So one of the most common examples is in uh, Daphnia or the water flea. And so on the left, um, under low predation, they typically exhibit a rounded head and a shorter spine. But under higher predation, they develop these pointed heads, elongated spines, um, and a thickened carapace in an attempt to evade predation. Another example in a species of plant is under low light, they tend to develop larger leaves and have fewer branches, but under high light, the same species develops smaller leaves and a lot more branches. And so in marine systems, people have been looking more and more at phenotypic plasticity over the last few decades. And when this review was conducted in 2013, there had been 16 studies done on cnidarians, um, but only one in a subtropical area like the Gulf of Mexico. And so phenotypic plasticity is important because it has the ability to buffer populations from temporal variation um, and also potentially help buy time in the event of environmental change. Now it's often described as like a silver bullet, but don't get me wrong, that's not what I'm trying to say here. It can be adaptive, it can be non-adaptive, or it can also be maladaptive. Um, and so especially under variable unpredictable conditions, it has a high likelihood um, of causing a harmful effect. And so like I said before, people have looked at phenotypic plasticity in cnidarians, and even more specifically, people have even studied them in octocorals as well, um, but they've looked at them in tropical mixotrophic species only. Um, and so they find variation between species, but they do find some commonalities across species. And so some of these are that in shallower environments, we see bushier colonies, um, and you also tend to see a greater density of polyps. And so a lot of these consistent differences that I'm listing here are often attributed um, to light availability that differs between shallow and deep environments. And so, like I said, they've looked at them only in tropical mixotrophic species, meaning that the species are getting their energy from both heterotrophically feeding and also their autotrophic symbionts that rely on light for photosynthesis. And so what happens when we look at this in a species that doesn't rely on photosynthesis and is only heterotrophically feeding? Do these patterns hold up? So octocorals can either have photosynthetic symbionts like this species here on the left, or they can only heterotrophically feed and don't rely on their symbionts like this species here on the right. Um, and so the distribution of species that are symbiotic or non-symbiotic varies across the globe. 
But what we typically expect is that in shallower environments, the distribution of species are predominantly symbiotic. And as you increase in depth and your light decreases, it switches over to being predominantly species that are non-symbiotic. And so some environmental variables that can have an effect on morphology are things like water movement, temperature, salinity, and again, light availability, because they can cause physical stress, an increased risk of detachment. It can have an effect on the food capture ability um, or photosynthetic potential. And so again, previous studies that have found these trends in differences in morphology between shallow and deep sites have often attributed them to a decrease in light availability, availability deeper. Um, and so the colonies are shifting their morphology in an attempt to increase their photosynthetic uh, potential. So I wanted to look at this in a common species of octocoral, um, Leptogorgia virgulata. So some, some of you may be familiar with this species. It's really common in this area. It's um, asymbiotic. So again, it's only heterotrophically feeding. Um, and not only is it common in the Gulf of Mexico, but it also, it has this range is really large. It can go, um, extends all the way up the East Coast, all the way up to the Chesapeake Bay, and as far south as uh, Brazil. And so it's a really interesting species. It can be inshore, offshore, and estuary. So it has a lot of tolerance. Um, and it commonly comes in three different uh, color morphs, magenta, yellow, and orange. Um, and so I wanted to look at this species in the Gulf of Mexico. We've been hearing a lot of talks recent, this last couple of days about how variable the Gulf of Mexico can be. Um, so anecdotally, some days you'll be diving and you'll be able to see your buddy and what you're looking at. And some days you can't see anything. It's like you all know this from working in Ecological Bay, especially, but you're like just feeling around trying to find these corals to the best of your ability. Um, but uh, less anecdotally, um, they're, it's very variable in, in temperature, salinity, um, and also turbidity. So one of the main drivers that this area is so variable is the output of the Apalachicola River. And so um, it, it fluctuates um, seasonally and as well as um, episodically in output of freshwater. Um, and with this comes variability in output of chlorophyll A, which can cause a high variability um, in turbidity, which we often see inshore, but these effects can extend offshore as well. And so today I'm going to be talking to you about two objectives. The first is whether or not these colonies differ in their morphology between inshore and offshore sites. And then I wanted to look at whether or not these potential differences in morphology are at all driven by phenotypic plasticity. And so to start out, um, I conducted a survey over four inshore sites. Um, they're around like Turkey Point Shoal, uh, Alligator Harbor, and one over by St. Mark's. Um, and four offshore sites, if you're familiar with those limestone reefs, reefs like Turtle Towers, allegedly places like that. Um, and so the inshore sites were on average around three meters deep and less than a kilometer from shore, whereas the offshore sites were on average 13 meters deep and almost 17 kilometers from shore. And so at each of these sites, I ran three transects. And uh, along the transects, I would count the number of colonies. And at each colony I would come to, I would measure the maximum height of the colony, count the number of branches, note the color, and take a tissue sample to bring back into the lab um, for micromorphological analysis. And so a lot of these sites um, look like this. And so if you're familiar with these reefs, you know that they're obviously not coral reefs. And so one of the predominant um, vertical habitat formers are things like these octocorals as well as sponges. Um, there's actually been studies done in the Atlantic showing that this species of octocoral is one of the greatest predictors of fish abundance. Um, so they're really an important species um, as well. So um, to look at the color distribution between inshore and offshore sites, I didn't expect this to be different, um, but in fact it is. So in this area, um, offshore sites are almost entirely made up of magenta colonies. You'll see occasionally a yellow or an orange, but they're almost all magenta. Whereas inshore sites are about 50-50 magenta and yellow with your occasional orange. Um, and so this is really interesting to me and I'm not entirely sure yet what's driving this pattern, um, but because it exists, I wanted to look at my data um, when I'm comparing inshore and offshore differences to be sure that some of the trends aren't actually driven by a difference in color distribution, if there are differences there. 
And so one of the things I wanted to look at was the bushiness of colonies, because like I said before, previous studies have shown that inshore colonies tend to be bushier than offshore, but that again was attributed to light availability. However, um, so what we find regardless of site is that as you increase in height, you also increase in the number of branches, which makes sense as you're growing. Um, but if you're located inshore, um, these blue points, you're significantly bushier than if you're located offshore. So as you increase in height, you have significantly more branches than you would offshore. But to be sure this wasn't driven by a color distribution, I compared magenta colonies inshore to magenta colonies offshore and the same trend holds. So that's not being driven by any distribution in color. And so I also wanted to look at the polyp density. So I said that I brought in a tissue sample to look at micromorphological traits. So I counted the density of polyps um, in a centimeter squared. And I found that inshore colonies had significantly more polyps than offshore colonies, which again was what uh, previous studies had found um, in photosynthetic species. And so again, I wanted to check to see if this was driven by color. And so with this, when I looked at magenta inshore colonies and magenta offshore colonies, there was no significant difference. And in fact, it's being driven by this distribution in color. So at inshore sites only, yellow colonies have significantly more polyps than magenta colonies. And so this leads us to wonder whether or not these are potentially the same species or not. We have seen that they are. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm looking into that currently. Um, but this gets into potential, potentially that genetic driver of differences in morphology that I mentioned at the beginning. So yes, colonies do differ in their morphology between inshore and offshore sites. Inshore colonies are significantly bushier than offshore, and there is a difference in polyp density, but it's driven by color. And so does Leptogorgia virgulata exhibit phenotypic plasticity in these morphological traits? And so some of you may be familiar with this. When we think of phenotypic plasticity, under no plasticity, we expect that an individual across all environments will have the same phenotype, so it will look the same. But under, if they have plasticity of traits across environments, they'll change their phenotype or they'll look different. And so I wanted to look at uh, the traits growth and branching. So to do this, I conducted a fully reciprocal transplant. Um, and so to walk you through it, I collected eight colonies from four sites, two inshore and two offshore. And then I fragmented each colony into 12 fragments that were about 14 centimeters long. And I transplanted three fragments from each colony back out to all the sites. And so at every site, there were 96 fragments and 384 fragments total across the whole experiment. And so I'd intended to leave this out for several months, um, but when we thought that Hurricane Ian was going to hit in the fall, I jumped and pulled them in before the Marine Lab closed. Um, so they're only out for 70 days, um, but we still saw some cool things, which is awesome on a short time scale. Um, so one thing to note is that this fully reciprocal design would have been really, really cool. Um, but when I pulled in the experiment, for some reason that we're not sure of, um, the colonies coming from the offshore site too were almost entirely gone at every other site. And so this could be that they died, but it could also be a methodological problem. And we're not sure what's causing it. Um, and so because of that, colonies coming from the second offshore site were I removed from my model. Um, but to be clear, colonies went to that offshore site still are included in the model. So everything is, the three sites that remain are still being transplanted between four sites total. And since there is this one missing, I can't show you a comparison between inshore and offshore. I have to show you comparisons between sites, but that's still interesting. And so I transplanted them on these um, frames. This is a picture from the offshore site. They're on these frames on the limestone reefs. Um, you can see the magenta fragments here. These yellow ones were part of a different study that I'm not going to talk about today. Um, but so they're out on these frames for 70 days um, inshore and offshore. And so what do we find? So again, if you remember under phenotypic plasticity, we expect that there's a change across environments. And so but looking at colonies transplanted between inshore site one and offshore site one, we see a significant difference in growth um, where those that went to inshore site one, regardless of where they came from, grew significantly more than those that were transplanted to offshore site one. And we see the same thing on a smaller magnitude between inshore site two and offshore site one. And both of these are significant. 
Now looking at these same inshore sites one and two going to offshore site two, um, between inshore one and offshore two, we see a significant effect of destination. Those at inshore one grew significantly more than those at offshore two. Um, however, between inshore two and offshore two, there's no significant difference. And so now looking at their branching, um, so it's kind of tricky to see, but this is an example here of these two fragments came from the same colony to begin with, and this one went offshore and that one went inshore. And so you can see that one branched and that one did not, um, but they came from the same original colony. And so we see a significant difference in branching, but only between inshore site one and offshore site one. And so it's more site specific than depth general. Um, and so then looking between the sites offshore and between the sites inshore, what we expect is something like this, where there's not a difference because in theory, if it's depth driving it, if I move from one site to another at the same depth, I should look the same, right? And so moving between the offshore sites, we don't see a significant difference, they're the same. However, moving between the inshore sites, we do see a significant difference, which is really interesting because again, it gets at this point that it's more site specific than it is um, depth specific. And again, we see the same thing with branching. And so it's also really interesting because inshore site one is at the mouth of um, Alligator Harbor and inshore site two is at Turkey Point. And these are really close together and ge like geographically, um, you can practically see one another from them. And so there's gotta be something happening there um, that's driving this difference despite being so close together. And so what we found is that, yes, growth and branching are plastic, but again, this is site specific. And so um, differences in polyp density and bushiness um, in the system are similar to what they found in other species that are photosynthetic, but while they related those to light in other species, it's not likely due to light in this system because they don't rely on um, photosynthesis. And so it's likely driven instead by something potentially like water movement or temperature fluctuation or things like that. And so um, we see similar trends across other species as well, like the plant species that I showed you at first, that it had more branches under um, in different sunlight conditions. Um, but again, with this, it's likely not driven by sunlight. Um, and so evidence of plasticity in this is really interesting, um, but again, it's, it can't just be explained by depth. It's more site specific than that. And so it's important that we're looking at this though, because again, plasticity has the ability um, to buffer populations from potential environmental change or environmental variability. And that's really important in a species like this that's such a big habitat builder. And so with that, I'd like to thank my, my advisor, Don Levitan and my lab and all the faculty at FSU and the immense amount of field work and lab help that I've had between grad students, undergrad students, um, lab techs, everything, as well as my funding sources, and I'll take questions. Um, we'll get Sean to, because he's got an observability on our bird and turkey point, and he has very different nutrient availability in the uh, sea, right? So huh. the nutrients is part of that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, especially since they're like heterotrophically reliant. Yeah. Thanks. I'll talk to him about that. Our next presenter is going to be Carson Ahrens with the United States Geological Survey. And she is going to be presenting on the variation in resource partitioning of three sea turtle species at a temperate foraging ground. Thank you for that introduction, Michael. Michael actually helped collect a lot of the data for this project. So um, just a little tidbit, that's exciting. Um, I will not be talking about apologic college today. Um, this study took place in St. Joe Bay. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the diet of the sea turtles in the bay and how they overlap and um, what the habitat has to do with that. Ooh. I did not know I put an effect on all those names. <laughs> okay, so the three species of sea turtle that are present in St. Joe Bay are loggerheads, Kemp's Ridley, and green turtles. These are also present in Apalachicola Bay. So part of this project is that we would really like to expand what we did for this um, into other areas such as Apalachicola. 
a little background on what their historic diet is. So loggerheads are a generalist species and they're listed as threatened. Um, so as a population, they are considered generalists, but a lot of people actually consider them as individuals to be specialists. So overall, they're gonna be eating a lot of crustaceans, bivalves, fish, um, even algae and seagrass, but dependent on the actual individual, there have been um, some cases where some loggerheads will just really only eat crustaceans or only eat certain things, which is pretty interesting. And Kemp's Ridley's are also generalists and they are listed as endangered. So they have a very similar diet to the loggerheads. They're very generalist species. Um, but for them, depending on the area, they can actually become specialists. So um, especially in the Northeast, they're known to focus a lot on crabs, um, whereas down here, they will kind of eat everything. And green turtles are special um, because when they're smaller, they're actually a generalist species. But as they become larger, they specialize on seagrass and algae and plant-based diet, which is sort of the opposite of what you would normally think for a species. As it gets larger, you would think that they would become more generalist. But for green turtles, they actually focus on seagrass as they become larger. And a little background on some tracking data that has been done in the Bay on these three species. So obviously where they're tracked is going to be where they're foraging for the most part. Um, so Lamont and Iverson looked at this and um, the greens are here in the top right. So you can see if you're not familiar with St. Joe Bay, it's like densely seagrass in the southern end here. So it makes sense that the greens are going to be spending a lot of their time in the southern end. Um, loggerheads are also spending most of their time in the southern end, especially focused there in the very lower part. And Kemp's Ridley, which was sort of unexpected, are using the entire bay. Um, so this might be because they are specialists, so maybe they're they're trying to find a very specific food item, whereas loggerheads are just like, I'll eat anything, I don't have to go anywhere, sort of thing. So all three species overlap spatially, as you can see in that image. I'll point out, I didn't talk about that one on the left. You can see where there's just one species is in the blue, which is obviously the Kemp's Ridley, an overlap of at least two species in orange, and then all three are obviously using that southern end of the bay that's going to be dense in seagrass and all kinds of crustaceans and bivalves for them to eat. So. All three are overlapping spatially and with diet items based on previously recorded diets. Um, loggerheads and Kemp's have the most potential for competition and potentially with those smaller greens because they are eating um, more omnivorously as they're smaller turtles. And the greens as they're larger are obviously expected to have a more seagrass based diet, which is different than the loggerheads and Kemp's. So to answer this question, um, if you're not familiar with stable isotopes, I'm just going to give a very brief description on how they work. Um, so looking at this plot over here, everything, every living organism has a ratio of carbon and a ratio of nitrogen. And from those ratios, we can get carbon 13 values and nitrogen 15 values. And so if you take the carbon and nitrogen values of an organism and then also what they're eating, you can actually take a look at and compare those to see what they're eating if you um, collect a variety of different organisms. So looking here on the plot, in general, the discrimination factor from one consumer to the next consumer is up 3.4 in nitrogen and over one in carbon. So we collected uh, 900 or 496 um, samples from sea turtles throughout the bay in St. Joe, you can see over there, and 216 different prey items. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but it ranges from algae to seagrass to crustaceans and pretty much any critter we could get our hands on in the bay. And from that, we got the stable isotope values. So for this graph in particular, we're really going to focus on A and B, um, loggerhead A and Kemp's B, and green F. Um, so I mentioned that 3.4 to 1 trophic discrimination factor for every animal, it's going to be a little bit different, but there are not many published studies for sea turtles on what that trophic discrimination factor is. So we compared two different factors and we chose the one that was most accurate based on which one, which sea turtles in the circles is most encompassed by all the different prey items that we collected. So that means that's most likely what their factor is going to be. So for that, it's loggerheads in A, camps in B, and green in F. So in these graphs, you can obviously see that the green turtles have a lot over here by the seagrass, um, and then the Kemp's and loggerheads are really encompassed in a variety of different organisms. Um, so from this mixing model, uh, we're actually able to 
get relative proportions of these different diet items. So the results from these, you can see that on the bottom line here, that's the proportion and listed on the side is all the different potential diet items. And this just gives us a general idea of what proportion of each of these items that we collected these turtles could be eating in this area. So for loggerheads, it was not really a surprise with crustaceans, gastropods, and fish. Kemp's Ridley's were crustaceans, gastropods, and seagrass. You can see the crustacean and gastropod percentage for loggerheads and Kemp's was very, very close to one another. So they're obviously heavily overlapping in their diet in this area. And then for green turtles, you can see almost 50% of seagrass. This is crustaceans and gastropods. Also, um, this was all of the green turtles. We also ran the green turtles separately based on size to see how that differed between the smaller turtles and the larger turtles. Um, and it went from 47% seagrass for the entire thing to closer to 80% for those larger turtles. So it really, really showed how that changed um, throughout their size. Kemp's Ridley's, it was a little surprising to see seagrass as an option. Um, it's only 19%, but still you would think some of these other diet items are gonna pop up before seagrass. Um, so for this, we don't really think that the Kemp's are directly foraging on seagrass, but they might just be eating lower trophic value items than the loggerheads that are closer to those seagrass values. And like I mentioned, the TDFs are not, trophic discrimination factors are not described for a lot of these species. So it could just be that the factor isn't perfect and this is just more studying that needs to be done to look at um, what that discrimination factor might be for Kemp's. Um, in addition to just looking at the diet proportions, we also looked at to see if their isotope values changed over the years. So we looked at a 10 year time period for a lot of these samples. And then as I mentioned, we also looked at oversize. Um, so loggerheads didn't really have um, really much significant. Like I said, they kind of eat the same thing based on their size and their range. Um, so not anything huge there. The Kemp's were the only species that changed their isotope values over the various years that we studied. Um, we're not entirely sure why it came out so was significant that Kemp seemed to be changing their diet throughout the years, whereas the loggerheads and the greens were much more consistent throughout sampling years. Um, and then for size, as we imagine the green turtles, it was significant for both carbon and nitrogen. And then for Kemp's, it was also significant based on their size, which is interesting. And this plot on the left is just showing you their general isotope values over the years. Um, so like I mentioned, Kemp's was very variable, but if you compare them to the other two, it was not anything extreme. They're not going to be eating one thing to something completely different the next year. Um, it just was statistically significant that they were eating something a little bit different. Um, and then size over here, it's really interesting to look at the green turtles because you can really see that obvious shift in size. So the blue is going to be the smaller turtles and the yellow is going to be larger turtles. And if you remember from that earlier plot, the seagrass was over here in the right hand corner. So based on this plotted value, it's really obvious that these larger turtles are totally shifting their diet. Um, and then Kemp's Ridley's also, you can see there's sort of a shift to a higher trophic level where you see as it turns yellow um, and green, there's a shift up compared to some of those lower blue values. So like I mentioned, loggerheads with size didn't really have much of a difference. Um, the Kemp's Ridley's means were significantly different, but their dispersions were not, which meant that they ate generally the same things. But um, based on our values and those plots before, it looks like as the Kemp's Ridley's get larger, they're specializing, um, which is similar to what those Northeastern turtles that I was talking about are doing, where they tend to specialize maybe specifically on crabs, which makes sense also if you remember the map um, that showed the Kemp's Ridley's use the entire bay. So it's very likely maybe they just really love blue crabs or really like a certain type of crab. So they're going to be foraging throughout the entire bay to look for what they need whereas the loggerheads are able to just use that smaller area. We also looked at overlap between these turtles. Um, this is also a good example of the Kemp's being more specialized than loggerheads. So this is their niche area. And the Kemp's are actually fully encompassed, 100% encompassed by the loggerhead turtles, which as we mentioned, Kemp's are critically endangered. So this, they tend to face the most um, competition for resources because what they're trying to eat, something else is also trying to eat everything that they want to eat, along with half the population that we have of green turtles in the bay. 
Um, so that makes it very difficult for Kemp's to find their resources, which is why they do have to use that entire base system. Um, and then greens, obviously, again, here we see that shift um, towards seagrass as they get larger. So they actually have the largest niche area out of all of them, which makes sense because the other two species don't have this extreme diet shift based on size. Um, in addition, as part of my master's thesis, we wanted to look at the differences between their isotopes before and after Hurricane Michael. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Um, just trying to look at what in the system could have been different before versus after Hurricane Michael. And if you remember, there was this break in the peninsula. It wasn't for very long, but we obviously had that water flushing in and maybe creating um, a different system that was previously seen. And then changes in water quality, there is obviously a lot of debris and pollution and runoff. So we just thought, let's just look and compare. We have data from before and after, we might as well see if there's a difference. So overall, did Hurricane Michael have an effect on the carbon or nitrogen values of the sea turtles? So to do this, we looked at two years pre-hurricane and two years post-hurricane. We used a generalized linear model to test the effects of multiple variables on the changes. Um, we looked at season and size, but for the point of this presentation, we're just going to look at the results from the hurricane. So there was actually a change, a significant change in nitrogen for all three species post-hurricane versus pre-hurricane. Um, the green turtles saw a small change in carbon as well. Um, as I mentioned, the average difference between trophic levels is about 3.4. So if you're looking at these changes, so you see plus 0.3, plus 1.03, plus 0.9, how it's changing is not even a complete trophic level. So this is not a significant change, but the fact that it came out significant for all three species is something that is really interesting. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to answer this question because we don't have those samples of those prey items before Hurricane Michael. So what we had previously when we were looking at all those different um, prey items, all those collections were collected later. So there's no way to say that, are this, is there something in the sea turtles that's going on that shift through nitrogen? or is what they're eating changing or is what it's hard to describe is what they're are they eating something different or is what they are eating different from what it used to be if that makes any sense so in summary nitrogen increase is very hard to interpret without having that comparable of the prey items before hurricane michael um, one study looked and saw that they looked at what items were in a certain base system before and after a major hurricane as well, because they just happened to be doing invertebrate studies all throughout this time period. Um, and they found that there are 13 species missing from their evaluations post storm. So it's very possible that what was available in the bay to these turtles did change and that could be why their nitrogen changed. Um, like I said, there are multiple changes to the bay in terms of potential salinity with that cut watershed runoff. Um, so there's a lot of variables and we're still trying to look into what maybe those changes were caused. So in conclusion, Kemp's may be experiencing the most interspecific competition because they have competition with not just the loggerheads, but also those smaller greens. And they're having to work a lot harder to find what they need to eat. Um, the most overlap occurred with loggerheads Kemp's and those smaller greens. Um, a large portion of the green turtles, which were 23 to 44 centimeters, appear to be omnivorous. And major disturbances may have long-term effects on the ecosystem, which like I said with the hurricane, um, there's a lot more that we have to dive into to answer that question as to why these nitrogen changes may have occurred. But they're not huge changes, so right now it's not a huge red flag, but just for future storms in the future, it's something that we can continue to look at. And that is all I have. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the emergency talk. I'm wondering that during the hurricane event, is mm -hmm. there any chance that like there is some export of terrestrial hydrogen to they like Maybe some of the material from terrestrial environment that are more enriched in density than the bay hydrogen. And then this material was consumed by the marine life, like during the tropic chain. So it's accumulated that 
and wish that everything is going down up to the future. So right. It's not just the developers have this enrichment, but also everybody has fails have this result. Exactly. That's what part of the hard question is. We don't have those pre-storm samples to know are those prey items, are they also enriched after the storm? Because if we had those pre-samples, we could say, okay, crustaceans used to have this isotope value, but post-storm they were also enriched in nitrogen. So that makes sense that obviously the turtles are going to follow that pattern. Um, but without those pre-storm samples, it's so hard to say. Um, so we're also trying to look around and see if there's other people that have collected these carbon and nitrogen, especially nitrogen samples of these prey items, so that we can definitively say, did the item that they're eating actually change, or is what they're eating also enriched in nitrogen, which makes it look like they're eating something different even though they're not. So that's a really good question, and we're, we're trying to dig into some samples that other people might have available. Yeah. Uh, you collect samples there, then you'd be able to see adjustment by the pressure versus the nitrogen levels, maybe that would yeah that would yeah that would probably be helpful like i said right now we only have two years worth of prey collection so from that it might be hard to collect but that's a really good idea to compare it over a longer period of time and see how much fluctuation there is that's a good idea any other questions sorry i talked fast <laughs> thank you All right, thank you, Carson. Um, our next presenter is gonna be Daniel Catazone with the United States Geological Survey. And he is going to be presenting on the home range and movement patterns of female diamondback terrapins at St. Joseph Bay, Florida. All right. So, um, also St. Joe Bay, where a lot of our work is done um, but like the presentation Carson gave, we are hoping to move some of the work that we do to other parts of the planet or including Apalachicola Bay. So why track terrapins? Just, you know, why track anything? But we wanted to find the home ranges of these turtles, identify the habitats they're using, um, which is especially important uh, right now in Florida. There's a lot of regulation changes with the species. So having this information to give to the managers and the people making these decisions um, is very important. They do unfortunately drown in crab traps. And that's actually one of the rules that is changing here in Florida. So you're gonna have to start adding uh, these turtle excluding devices to recreational crab traps, but where crab traps are placed uh, the regulations could be a little bit different. So that's why I want to see what habitats they're uh, using. Uh, the technology, especially as time has gone on, we've been able to make tags smaller. So technology that's been previously unavailable to these small species is now actually available. And uh, the two types I'm going to be talking specifically about today are satellite and acoustic tracking. So just some quick background, if you're not familiar with terrapins, uh, they're a coastal species. They're the only species in the United States that's, um, they're small, they're about the size of your typical pond turtle, red-eared slider, um, that are found all the way from Massachusetts to Texas, so very big range. Uh, this map I love showing because I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the IUCN, and if you look at the Florida Panhandle, they say that the terrapins aren't here for most of it. I can tell you that's a lie, they're here. Um, more specifically, in our zoomed in, you can see where St. Joe Bay is right here in the middle. They don't think terrapins are here. Um, they are, they're here in Apalachicola Bay as well. Um, so one of the things that we also want to do is help fill that gap in the current knowledge on the species. So our female terrapins, um, even though the tags have gotten smaller, they're not small enough for everything. So we could only use them on adult um, individuals. They have a plastron length, which is the bottom of their shell of 111 millimeters, and the satellite tags, um, based off their weight, we're looking for females that weigh over 800 grams. So we try to keep everything under 5% uh, of the body weight of the individuals. Satellite tracking, taking all the cute terrapin photos now because so we are going to be uh, lacking. So we use um, two types of satellite tags, um, pretty much the same, but um, they're both from wildlife computers uh, using the Argo satellite system. The tag on the 
left is designed for hard shell turtles. And fun fact, the one on the right is actually designed for penguins, but perfectly fit on a terrapin shell and was the right size. So we were able to utilize them on the terrapins as well. So what you have here is basically we got a heat map. So we had 10 individuals that we were able to satellite track in the bay. And based off the points that they were able to transmit, we were able to put together these heat maps of where their activities were most concentrated throughout the bay, which is a little bit different dependent on the individual and even dependent on the time of year. Uh, we did get a variety of detections and home range size. So you can see here we had as few as 23 detections, which wasn't great, um, but we did get um, up to 694 um, detections, which is super awesome. More points, um, the better of home range estimates we can get, which ranged anywhere from three kilometers squared to 20. And what's really um, great about using these tags is previously a lot of work with terrapins and these smaller species is VHF, a lot of manual tracking, which could be limiting because you may look over here, but the terrapins may be moving out of the range that you're searching in. So the satellite technology is giving us the opportunity to see where the terrapins are going even when we can't access them. So nice pretty picture of all of our terrapin tracks overlaid on each other. So this is what you saw in the previous slide, but all put together. Um, you can see there's a lot of overlap. Some are using different parts of the bay than others. Um, lots of use on these eastern and southern parts of the bay. This is also where most of the salt marsh habitat is available in the bay, so it makes sense. They are a salt marsh species. Um, but there is some tracks and some of the points that we're getting that are actually even going into the seagrass habitat. So we are seeing, at least in this bay system, a use of not just the salt marsh, but the seagrass. So just to give you an idea of what um, some of the tracks that we got, um, this individual we tracked over eight months. And you can see, starting from the left, going through all the months, found a spot, liked the spot, staying in the spot, has not moved. Um, this is one of our smaller home ranges. So this individual has her spot, likes to stay here, probably has all the resources she needs, not a lot of movement. Um, and this does encompass the nesting season for these individuals. So it is something that we take into account when looking at the females is that turtles sometimes will include movements to their nesting sites. So this is one of our more stationary tracks that we saw with some of our individuals. Um, this track was over seven months. Um, this came out a larger home range size, and um, it's hard to see with the dots, but purple is the beginning of the month, yellow is the end of the month. But you can see this female is using a lot of the eastern side of the bay going north to south throughout the course of the month. So she's using a lot more of the habitat compared to um, the female that you saw in the other one. So again, we see a lot of these, um, one of the other trends we saw with these repetitive movements up and down. And then um, the last one that we kind of trend that we saw was these females that were using not only the east side of the bay, but the southern end of the bay. And these tracks do have points, especially that are going into some of the seagrass habitats. So, you know, shortest distance between two points, straight line takes you straight across seagrass. Um, so one of the questions that we're hoping to answer and actually ties into what Carson just presented is we're doing a similar study um, to what she did with the sea turtles with the terrapins to see if we can see if the diet items that they're eating are ones prevalent in seagrass, salt marsh, both. Um, and that's something we actually might also be able to do with some of the samples we've collected from uh, Apalachicola Bay. So stay tuned for that, maybe next year. Um, so that was pretty much it for our satellite tracking. We've got these three different friends that we saw in their movements, um, anywhere from you know just a few months to eight months, which is pretty good. That's about the life of the tag. Downside to going smaller is the batteries also get smaller. Length of the time we can track them goes down. But um, again, the, you know, just showing the size of the areas that these terrapins are using um, compared to some of the other research that's out there, people may be searching a lot smaller areas than the terrapins are actually utilizing. It's also 
important to note that we're working in a base system here. Terrapins are found in a lot of different habitats. I mean, we all know coastal areas, salt marshes, you know, estuaries, smaller creeks. So part of the patterns and the movements we may see are due to the fact that they're in a more open bay system. So now in addition to the satellite tracking, we actually have an acoustic ray set up in St. Joseph Bay that we've used for sea turtle sharks and terrapins. Um, originally started with, let's just see what they're doing. And um, I got some exciting results. So the terrapins were all affixed with these Vemco brand um, acoustic tags. Um, these are nice because they're smaller. We're actually able to put these on females and males, but um, we didn't actually, we only got one or two of our males on acoustic receivers. So that was interesting to see that there it may also be um, a difference in the habitat use between the species. I did forget to mention in the beginning, um, there is a size difference. They are sexually dimorphic. So this is an adult female and the adult males can be about half the size of the adult females. So it does make sense that the females would have access to deeper water, um, larger movements, things like that. So for this, um, we have six individuals that we've affixed with acoustic tags. Um, one of them is completely done transmitting. That's the one at the top. We have actually found her. She lost her tag and we didn't recognize her. I would have slapped another one on there, to see where she went. But um, we got a lot of detections, 214 detections, um, over a year of tracking. Uh, we're going to pull our acoustic data hopefully in the next month. So we'll see if uh, we can update some of these numbers and pick up some of these females. Um, it has been cold, so the turtles are probably a lot um, less active than they would be during the summer. But just to give you an idea, all of our acoustic receivers here, which are all these colorful dots, including the three white ones, are all placed out in the seagrass beds on the edges of channels. So these aren't in the salt marsh habitat. Um, so the terrapins, at least the females, are definitely venturing at least somewhat into our seagrass habitats in order to get picked up onto these. Now, again, we don't know if that's the forage to move to different sites. Um, that's one of the questions we hope to answer with some of this data. But you can see um, different uses by the different individuals. So each color is a different individual. Our individual in red really used a lot of the southern end and even up into um, the northern part of the bay and some even went deep out so the solid blue ones right there that's in the middle of the bay middle of the seagrass like there is no way that receiver accidentally picked her up in the salt marsh so that's really exciting to see these terrapins utilizing some of these habitats because again going back to some of those regulations that the state's implementing one of the things that they may look at is, oh, terrapins are only this amount off the shoreline. So we only need to worry about crab traps in this area. But what some of our data is showing that the terrapins may actually be utilizing more habitat uh, than previously expected. So to give you a close up, um, I only have the complete data for this one individual. Um, again, we were able to track her over two years um two different years but only about a year's worth of data um, and basically what this is showing you is uh, all the different movements based off her points so in the first year that we tracked her um, she was caught and released in the southern end we see some movements down there in the southern end of the bay going into 2021 um, we're seeing a lot of movements back and forth between um, the different receivers the size of the circle also corresponds to the amount of detections that these individuals got um, on a receiver at a given time. So you can see she really likes the southern end of the bay. Um, she does make these movements up to the northern part of the bay, which is interesting to see because we originally found her in the south end, um, which is also why this technology is so exciting to use along with the satellite tracking because for an individual that we caught in the south seemed to be utilizing a lot of the south she does make some ventures up so if you're utilizing something like bhf you might not necessarily capture those movements north but it fully encompasses the amount of area that these individuals are using so i'm hoping we get a lot more detections um, from our other five females 
uh, this coming year. Again, um, the males that we did, we did get like one or two detections, but just not at the rates that we were seeing with the females. We actually originally started this with males because the males are too small for the satellite tags and the males don't want to be tracked apparently. So uh, we're not able to use that on them. And that's it. And a big thank you to everyone who has helped and contributed to all aspects of our Terrapin research. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. So that um, time of year could be um, a nesting movement. So one of the questions that we still need to answer is whether or not the turtles are nesting every year. Um, they definitely have the capacity to. Um, some of the available nesting sites are definitely along this eastern side of the bay, um, all the way from the south end, and this is kind of cut off, like Port St. Joe, higher up. Um, we've had accounts of nesting all along that area, so it could be that she's moving north to access some of these nesting sites. Um, we are actually adding some more acoustic receivers um, more north along the east side to try to capture that because we're curious if they are moving up to some of these areas during the nesting season. But our best guess is that this is for um, a nesting event. Yes. Do you have any data on um, side class of sex that are caught in crab traps and things like that? And how that might, and if the state has determined like a size determination for the goal for the turtle excluder device? Yeah, so there is a size. I do not recall the size at the moment because I think they just changed it because there is definitely, you know, crab trappers don't want anything that's gonna like reduce their catch or the size of what they catch. Um, typically, you're only going to catch males and juvenile females in these traps, um, just given the size. A true like adult female, like some of the individuals we saw here, um, are just too big to get into the crab trap openings. But um, yeah, that's one of the things that we're trying to figure out and answer the question too, like why aren't we catching the males on these acoustic uh, receivers or uh, we can't use the satellite tracking, unfortunately. But we do see um, the males, based off our market capture work, utilizing similar movements, um, but it's just whether or not they're going through the salt marsh or if they're cutting across the um, bay into some of the seagrass habitats. I hope that answers the question. Any other questions? Yes. So in those areas, it might have simple substrate for nesting and stuff like that. Do you do any studies involving like why those areas are better for nesting than others um, we do not yet but we are working on it um, we actually have a citizen science project and something that i'm actually trying to get Aner involved in to collect data on uh, nesting sites um, we do have areas throughout the panhandle that we're trying to collect data on um, but you know they're definitely looking for areas that um, they do have high predators from raccoons, possums, things that can dig into the nest, rats. Um, a little island that I thought was a perfect nesting spot. We set up a camera and found out that not only raccoons visit it, but it has like a very substantial rat population on it. So I was kind of sad, but they're looking for those kind of areas. Um, sandy or even shell hash are things that they're looking that they can dig into. Um, you definitely don't want anything with like two, thick or dense of vegetation, anything too overgrown. Um, and you see a lot more of that along this eastern side of the bay. Definitely not the only place in the bay, but just where we see, um, it's also where most of the salt marsh is, so it's kind of like the best of both worlds. There are definitely spots along the western side of the bay. The southern end of the bay is a little bit thicker in terms of like the vegetation um, and less potential open areas. Also, a lot of the islands in this in St. Joe Bay do get fully covered during high tide, so there's not access on islands for them to necessarily nest on. So definitely, probably focusing more on some of the main shorelines. Do you still work on black islands? Uh, we have not done anything specifically. Um, definitely have had some accounts of nesting out there, um, 
but the nesting aspect is one of our newer portions of our research project that we're kind of building in and figuring out what are the best ways to answer it. We do a lot of sea turtle research, so we're trying to like copy and paste some of that from sea turtles over to terrapins to hopefully try to answer some of these questions. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending here in person and all the folks that online. We really appreciate you guys being here. And a um, couple last things. You've heard it, you heard it a couple times already, but the um, symposium, symposium has been recorded and will be available on the Apalachicola Reserve website. Uh, the Padlet will continue to be available. Uh, the link is in the um, handout section of the, the webinar, or I believe it's also linked in the email that you received from Kennedy. Uh, yes, also on, on the, the schedule. Um, so if you are interested in connecting with any of the researchers or research that you heard about over the last day and a half, uh, that's a great way to connect with folks. And where am I forgetting? <laughs> yes, yes. So thank you again to everybody and um, appreciate you being here.